Hey, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. I'm Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. Terrific to have all of you with us today for what I think is going to be, uh, you know, an, an energizing and, and pretty fascinating uh, series of presentations and conversations around the topic of elevating college completion. Uh, we have been talking a great deal in recent years, of course, about higher education and higher education reform. Much of this conversation has focused on costs, on issues of access. Um, what has struck us, uh, my, my, our partners in Third Way and those of us here thinking about this issue, um, is that more of this attention can and should be fruitfully directed to the question of whether students actually walk away from higher education uh, with the skills and the credentials that they have earned whether all this time and money is actually being put to good use. So that's really what this series of papers and what today's conversations are about. Um, the hashtag for those of you with us here and those of you who are watching at home is going to be hashtag elevate completion, uh, elevate completion. The event is being live streamed, of course, and all five papers uh, are available outside in hard copy, and you can also find them all available online. Um, we're going to present this over the course of three sessions. I'll chair the first. Uh, my colleague, uh, Lene erickson Hatoski will chair the second, and Bethany Little will chair the third. Um, I am going to actually turn it over to Lene to say a couple more substantive words of introduction to just frame the conversations. For those of you who may not be familiar, Lene is Vice President for Social Policy and Politics at Third Way. Uh, she's previously served on President Obama's Third Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And uh, she has been a pleasure to work with throughout this project. Lene. Thank you, Rick, and thank everyone for joining us here today. We're really excited about this series of papers that we've released yesterday, uh, hot off the presses, and very excited to have you all to have a substantive conversation with the authors and uh, do all of the learning from what they have found. Um, we actually just finished a bunch of focus groups on higher education at Third Way, and it, it is remarkable how consistent everyone's description is of the problems that exist in higher education. They say that it's all about cost. College is too expensive, it's unaffordable for middle class families, and the costs are going up. And we do think that that's an issue, that's a problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, but what happens when people actually sign up for college, start to go, and then take out those loans, and they don't actually end up with a degree? And that conversation is one that policymakers, I think, need to pay a lot more attention to across the aisle. And that's why we're really excited about this partnership with AEI and Third Way um, to elevate that issue and make sure that it is getting the attention that it deserves. So right now, People don't really realize, I think, and, and the voters we talk to don't realize, that there is actually a pretty big completion crisis within the higher education system. So if you're going to a four-year college, um, you have about a one in two chance of graduating. That means 50% of students that enroll and are accessing college aren't actually completing with the degree that they intended. That's a huge problem. The numbers are even worse when we look at two-year colleges. And we know that that problem is, is not just a problem for those students, but also for taxpayers. We spend $130 billion a year investing in our higher education system, and we're not getting the kinds of outcomes that we'd like to see out of that investment. Um, it's also creating a, about a half a trillion dollar drag on the economy. So it's an important question for individual students, for the larger policymaking community, and for the country that we really focus on this and try to figure out bipartisan solutions. So our authors have looked at the landscape of college completion today, also looked at what might be done in order to address these issues at the institution level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And we're excited to have that conversation with you all today. So as you heard from Rick, you can follow the conversation online at hashtag elevate completion. So please do that, ask lots of questions, and we look forward to having a robust conversation. I'll turn it back to Rick. All right, Matt, Sarah, come on up. Okay, um, what we're gonna kick off here with is a first panel. We have uh, two remarkably uh, thoughtful uh, papers to get walked through by the authors. Um, before we get started, let me say that these papers and the other three that uh, we'll be discussing 
uh, were made possible by the generous support of the Rakes Foundation, who have both underwritten uh, this research and analysis wow. and uh, this larger partnership effort with Third Way. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's an important topic and I appreciate the support. Uh, Sarah Turner is director of, is Department of Economics Chair, uh, Souter former. Family. Former, that's right. Thank God. Thank heavens for you. Yes. You're so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we get for only updating these things every third year. Um, it is the former uh, chair of the economics department at the University of Virginia, uh, the Souter family professor and a university professor at the University of Virginia, and a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's a principal investigator of the Expanding College Opportunities Project and has won a bushel of awards for places like IES, the Gates Foundation, Spencer Foundation, and such. Uh, most important, she was the person who was hired at the exact same time I was at UVA, oh, more than two decades ago now, oh, and who kept me sane um, uh, uh, until they could ease me out and find a casual retirement home for me here <laughs> at, at AEI. Um, Matt Chingos is the director of the Urban Institute's Education Policy Program uh, and executive editor of Education Next. Uh, his books uh, include Game of Loans, The Rhetoric and Reality of Student Debt, and Crossing the Finish Line, Completing College at America's uh, Public Universities. Um, Sarah, would you please be kind enough to get us started? Let's start. So uh, uh, let me uh, call out Rick and Lene for really bringing this group together. And we should also thank Cody, uh, who you forgot, I believe. Uh, I did. Uh, in, in for uh, just making things happen here. He's, he's an incredible asset to your team. Uh, anyway, this will be a fun conversation, and I will keep my remarks hopefully brief because the really fun part will be the, the discussion. So as um, the, the issue, let's go. Uh, the college completion rate challenge is not a new challenge. College completion rates have actually been stagnant for at least a quarter century, and they're really not that much worse than they've been for a half a century. Sort of, as, as Lene said, uh, it's about a 50% completion rate. Uh, so why, is, why are we tackling this now? Why are we <coughs> using words like crisis uh, to describe where we are in terms of college completion? Well, the first reason is that college completion rates have a bigger impact now than they did uh, two decades ago or three decades ago. The returns to a degree, uh, college graduate versus high school graduate, are now at about 80% on average, where they used to be about 40% uh, back in the 70s. So it matters more in terms of money. And what you get for being some colleges, we'll show as we get going, uh, is actually not that much better than being a college graduate. Uh, at the same time, we've, you know, we've, we've done great things on the enrollment front. We've moved from about 45% to about 70% of recent high school graduates enrolling in college. So that's kind of the access margin. Uh, but it, you know, if you look back in 1997, you couldn't, where's Mark? I mean, Mark is, has not joined us yet with federal statistics, but the federal government didn't even collect college completion rates, okay? It was actually in the NC2A that was the organization that collected college, college graduation rates. So actually focusing on attainment is a fairly new phenomenon. We can spend a lot of time talking about how to calculate these things. But somebody got the memo I think actually in the last decade or so, maybe 15 years because we're getting older, and we've had a flurry of discussions of attainment uh, at the government or at the federal government level, at the state government. So I can go through my list of everyone uh, from President Obama to the uh, Gates Foundation to the Lumina Foundation, issuing calls and promises of doubling the number of college graduates, or um, once again becoming first in the world in terms of college graduates. But I don't think we're going to make any of those targets. This is a hard and complicated problem, 
Okay, so if anybody is expecting a quick fix, a you know a sort of three bullet point solution uh, at the end of this, uh, I think we're going to be disappointed. At the same time, I think persistence and innovation can make a great deal of progress on this challenge. Uh, I'm going to give you a little picture of the landscape as we go forward, an overview of existing uh, federal and state completion. Pro uh, 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 initiatives, and then some thoughts going forward. Does that work for everyone? Okay. Uh, and I may even skip some slides because I know Cody's going to cut me off before too long. Uh, the returns to college have increased. Okay, let's go. My colleague Bridget Terry Long has some good excuse like becoming dean of the Harvard uh, School of Education. So she's not here, and I've stolen some slides from her presentation. But what you want to take away from this picture, which shows uh, median earnings uh, for uh, high school only, some college, associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees, is that the big difference is in that BA, de getting the de BA degree is the big prize here. Uh, getting, touching college in some way, shape, or form, whether that's a lot of credits or no, or just a couple of credits without getting a degree, doesn't buy you much over the long horizon. About 13% relative to ooh, about a 70% uh, premium for getting the BA degree. Now I'll note though that as you go down to look at the 25th percentile of different degree types, be, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, uh, the bottom of the some college group actually does worse uh, than those at the median of the high school group. So uh, again, we've got these big differences in earnings that are motivating this discussion. Uh, to college completion rates, uh, what we have, uh, uh, um, I'm going to make, a, I think, a, a, a big point. Uh, these differences in college completion rates reflect both student characteristics and institution characteristics. So what you see, for example, for private universities is a function of both the students who attend those universities and the resources that those, those institutions provide. But uh, going from top to bottom, you should see, you, you know, even if you're in the back row, at least for the main university, for the four-year university categories, those lines are pretty flat. They actually are headed upward uh, for private and public universities. Those are doctorate degree granting institutions that do a substantial amount of research. The broad access institutions uh, have either been stagnant or declining, where we see actually a, decline, a further decline along the bottom uh, for for-profit four-year institutions. So again, you're seeing about 76% at the top for private universities. Public broad access institutions are about 40%. In the right-hand panel, you see two-year institutions. Uh, for-profit institutions actually do pretty well in this sector. Public institutions do very poorly at about 26% on average in terms of completion rates. Uh, I think a, you know, a big point to take away from this is that completion rates also, again, both in terms of selection into types of institutions, are very different depending on where you are in family circumstances. So again, this is going to com combine different, uh, a whole set of factors here, pre-collegiate achievement as well as income. But what we see over time, the left-hand panel is enrollment, the right-hand panel is degree receipt, and the takeaway message here is that the gaps have gotten larger over time in degree receipt by family income. The bottom income quartile is the furthest to the left. The highest income quartile is the furthest to the right. Uh, again, the gaps in completion are very large. And unless there's, there's uh, action to address this problem, uh, it's likely that the college, the college attainment stage exacerbates inequality and limits uh, mobility here. OK, so we've got gaps widening over time. Uh, we're skipping that slide. Uh, what you want to take away, and Rick's made this point with Mark Schneider in a different book. Mark's going to make it again here later today, is that there's e e e 
there, um, first, let me explain uh, what these graphs show. The, uh, we've got public institutions, four-year institutions to, to focus your attention a little bit. I, uh, uh, on the, the left panel, on the right panel, we've got private institutions. Your takeaway on the x-axis, we've got expenditures per student. Four minutes? OK. Uh, the key issue is that we've got an upward slope, so money matters would be point number one. Your second takeaway is that for any point of expenditures, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Okay, so there are some institutions that have high completion rates, others that have low completion rates. We'll carry forward from there. I'm particularly concerned about what happens at the bottom. Okay, and what I've shown, you can pick a threshold as to what you regard as unacceptable. I regard having a completion rate less than 20% as unacceptable. Uh, and what you see is that we've got a lot of students, I think about 682,000 students, uh, that are at these institutions where your odds of getting out with a degree are about one in five. And what you see is is that, you know, and I think it's not uncommon to hear people talk about for-profit institutions in this context. Indeed, they're the biggest number of institutions here at 123, but the majority of students that are actually affected by these low completion rate institutions in the four-year sector are actually at nonprofit and public institutions. So this is an equal opportunity pitch here. Uh, in addition to these numbers, another sort of ballpark, uh, you know, sort of metric for how do I know completion rates are bad at an institution rate. If your three-year cohort default rate is, is higher than your completion rate, I think there's a, 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 a prima facie problem here. And indeed, we have nearly 300 institutions for which that is the case in the US. OK, um, we can go on about sort of what the data look like, but I know I'm going to get cut off here. We, what are our policy tools? We have money. Money matters, OK? And real quickly, we've seen a decline in state support for higher education. And uh, recent work by Deming and Walters does provide the strong link between actual expenditures and student attainment. So money matters. Don't want to take this off the table. The federal government also spends a lot of money, about $156 billion, of which about $90 billion of that is loan funds, on funding students. We have a problem. Those institutions that enroll the greatest number of Pell Grant recipients are actually those with the lowest completion rates. OK, so that's a real challenge here. Money matters, but we got to go beyond money in terms of thinking about policy solutions here. So our, we've got essentially, we've got supply side tools and demand side tools. And I'm going to just jump right, right to this. Money matters. Money's a necessary. Uh, it's a necessary condition, but we got to go beyond uh, money here. Um, We've got to think about improving college choice. Okay, so do our kids are kids making good choices if they are enrolling in an institution in which their likelihood of getting a degree is one in five? How we improve college choice? Rick, Rick is going to ask me about in the Q and A, so we'll just we'll we'll go go forward and think a bit about the supply side challenges again. What are our tools? Well, what, the, the federal government holds the strongest stick in terms of cutting institutions off when they're not meeting expectations. Cutting an institution out of Title IV financial aid is essentially a death sentence if you're in the for-profit sector. We actually have a different problem, though. It's much harder to close an institution or get an institution out of business if they're underperforming in the nonprofit or public sectors. And that, I think, is a fundamental challenge, primarily for states, uh, to think about how to force restructuring in these other types of, of institutions. Uh, I will note that we've got an increasing number of states, about 32, I think, that have performance-based policies in terms of how how they allocate their state aid. The jury is still out on this. Uh, and again, let me just uh, uh, stop here because 
Cody's going to give me the, uh, the, the hook in just a second. But a college completion is one of the things we should be caring about in this post-secondary space. But we run the risk of, of, of exacerbating unintended consequences if we focus exclusively on college completion and don't think about a whole a portfolio of college outcomes, including uh, earnings, uh, major choice, and so forth. And with that, Mr. Chingas. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my job was to think about some of the student characteristics that are predictive of college completion. And I ended up focusing my paper, my remarks today, on academic uh, preparation as a key predictor of, of college success. Um, but before I get to that, I want to start my talk by talking about something that my talk's not really about, because I think it's important to acknowledge that obviously there's a lot more going on in higher education than just academic uh, preparation. We know there are troublingly large gaps in outcomes by socioeconomic status, by race and ethnicity, uh, by, by gender. Um, and one distinction I'll make today, these, these are characteristics that can't be changed by education um, policymakers, but it is important to understand how they play out in terms of outcomes. I kind of want to briefly just put up a couple of pictures showing these, these troubling disparities. Um, and, and once again, the characteristics can't be affected by, by policymakers, but obviously the way that they play out in the world um, can be. So I think it is important to keep that in mind. So this shows outcomes by uh, family income quartile, um, I believe for, for the Nell's eighth graders way back in the, back in the 80s. But if you, you can update these with more recent data, and I'll show you some it more recent data. It looks the same. Um, maybe it's a little worse. I don't know. So you see, you know, uh, the high school graduation rates, there's disparities. Among those who graduate from high school, there's disparities in enrollment rates. Among those who enroll in college, there's disparities in graduation rates. So you see by age uh, 28 or 30 or something, if you grew up in the top income quartile, you're like almost five times as likely to have gotten a bachelor's degree than someone from the bottom income quartile. And you see a similar pattern of results by, by race uh, and ethnicity. So it's important to, to bear in mind that there are these, the, these troubling uh, disparities. Um, and they've got attention. I've, I've written about them quite a bit, as have, have Sarah and, and, and others. But, but I feel like academic preparation is, is a topic that's gotten quite a bit less attention, which is why I've decided to focus uh, the paper on this topic. And I think it's particularly important because although it surely reflects underlying ability to some degree, it can also be affected by policy and practice. The other side of my life, when I put my K-12 hat on, we worry about how to get people to learn more stuff in elementary and, and secondary schools. And, you know, our policy is to, to try and do that. And I think, it, obviously, it's sort of obvious that if people know more stuff and learn more things, they're probably going to be more successful in college. Um, but exactly what that relationship it is and what the best way to measure it and uh, what it means for policy, I think, is, is less, less obvious. So I, I'm going to kind of just start with the fact that you know, academic preparation is extremely predictive of bachelor's degree attainment rates. Um, so what, what this chart shows you is, uh, is by both family income quartile, which is kind of what I showed you before, but then also by a uh, quartile of a test score administered to a national representative group of kids in 10th grade. This, this, these are more recent data. These aren't from the 80s anymore. Um, and what you see is that for each of the income groups, there's just a huge relationship between, between that test score measure of ability and academic preparation, all that stuff kind of lumped together. Um, right? So among kids from uh, the, say, the bottom income group, if you're in the top quarter of test scores, you're 50% likely to get a bachelor's degree. In the bottom, less than, less than 10%. And for the top income kids, it's the same thing. And then if you look at the, the bars that are the same color, so say bottom scoring kids from different income quartiles, you see there's a relationship there. there are, the disparities in, in bachelor's degree attainment remain even after looking controlling for income. So that's why I put that in the, in the first slide, why I think it's important. But Within these groups, the different colored bars, the relationship is much, much steeper than, than the same colored bars. So in that sense, academic preparation is more predictive of bachelor's degree attainment rates than, than family income is. But obviously, we can measure academic preparation in different ways. And one way that a lot of college admissions offices measure it is high school grades and test scores on consistent tests like the SAT and the ACT. And I think people like test scores because they're objective in some sense, and people don't like high school grades because of grade inflation and, you know, does the grade really mean the same thing in different high schools? But it turns out there's been quite a bit of research on, on this, and th this is some from work that I've done, but it's consistent with work others have done. And what you find is that high school grades are consistently much more predictive of college completion rates among people who, who go to college than our uh, test scores, or it's the ACT or, or the AC, uh, SAT. Uh, so what you see here is that for 
groups of kids with the same range of SAT or ACT scores, here they're on the, the old SAT scale, having a higher high school GPA is associated with a much greater likelihood of, of college completion uh, among college students. Um, and once again, you follow the similar color bars, and I'll make it easier by, I'll, I'll flip, the, flip the things here. So now this shows you, it's the same chart as before, the same exact data, except I'm showing you for the different groups of high school GPAs, what's the relationship between SAT, ACT scores, and graduation rates. You see, there's not much. At the very bottom, if you get a really bad score, it looks like that's predictive of being less likely to graduate from college. But past that, it doesn't make, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If you sort of flip back between these two, you can see, right, there's grades, and there's test scores, right? So if you see two kids and they have the same grades, um, one kid has a better test score, it actually doesn't tell you that much. You see two kids with the same exact test score in the SAT, the one with the higher grades is a much better bet in terms of uh, being likely to complete from college. And, and I think this is sort of intuitive once you think about it, because earning good grades requires consistent behaviors over time, right? It's not just about being smart or, or, or getting a good score on a test. It's about showing up to class, participating, turning in assignments, doing extra credit, taking quizzes, kind of the, the kind of stuff you have to do every day, the kind of having your act together uh, kinds of characteristics, which I think intuitively makes sense that people who, who, who demonstrate that in high school are also more likely to do the kind of stuff it takes to graduate from college. Because once again, to graduate from college, I think anyone who's been to college kind of has a sense that you don't have to be the smartest whip. You can, you got to show up, right? You got to show up and turn your things in and... You know, and if you're in a class... That's my experience. Right, right. <laughs> right. Maybe I'm just projecting here, right? <laughs> um, but I kind of want to make a related point on this. When we talk about kind of college readiness, career readiness, uh, pe people are often out there kind of hawking data that say, you know, the share of kids who meet our college readiness benchmark has gone up or gone down or, or stayed the same. Uh, and I think you have to remember that, that those kinds of analyses, I mean, sometimes they're useful, but I think in general they're, they're, they're pretty arbitrary and I think oversell a little bit. So what this shows you is the relationship between ACT composite scores and uh, the percent of students achieving a certain uh, first-year GPA in college. And I'm using first-year GPA here because the, the admissions test scores and the SAT and ACT are more predictive of that. And they're, that's, that's what those test makers are kind of are, are going for. And what you see here is that kind of the more... The better test score you have on the ACT, the more likely you are to get, a, to get good grades in your first year of college. But it's a smooth relationship, right? If this college readiness stuff were real, and in fact that these benchmarks actually meant anything, you'd see once you meant the benchmark, there was just this, it was like kind of like an S-curve, right? There's just this big jump, and that actually means something. So the way kind of I like to talk about this is you should think of a college readiness uh, measure more like a body mass index, sort of a continuum that's something about your health than like a pregnancy test where it's like you're pregnant or you're not. And, you know, and I think my issue is people talk about these like they're pregnancy tests. So that's kind of more of a, a little bit of a tangent soapbox point, but I, but I thought worth putting in there. Uh, the other component of high school grades is that there's research indicating it matters not just what your, what your GPA is, but the courses that you, that you take also, also matter a lot. Students who take more rigorous courses in high school are more likely to succeed in college. Once again, maybe not a uh, a brilliant insight, but important to think about because that's something we can actually do something about, right? Maybe we don't know how to make kids smarter by maging, waving a magic wand, but we can put them in, in harder courses, put them in courses where they're more likely to learn the kinds of skills that are important for success in college. And we have some rigorous evidence from a few things, such as a double-dose algebra course in Chicago where kids who uh, were behind in algebra got a double dose of it, got two periods of it, and those kids were more likely to both score better on math tests in high school and more likely to, to go to college. Unfortunately, we don't have much research that tracks kids from those kinds of interventions in high school all the way through college uh, graduation. Um, so I think it's important to continue to think about how to make that link and how to know what interventions in high school are going to influence not just success in high school and entry into college, but also uh, success in college. So when we're thinking about these different measures of college readiness, you know, all of which are you know, predictive of how likely students are to be successful in college, we have to ask the question, what measures do we want to target? You know, should we go out there and try and improve students' test scores? Should we uh, try and improve, improve their grades? So, you know, test scores obviously can be gamed, but I think they are useful as an objective measure of what students know, even if for some things like predicting completion, they're not so useful. Um, and grades are more subjective, but as I said before, they capture these behaviors that we think um, are, are important. Um, of course, we also want to think about what the, the courses those grades are from. Uh, because obviously one way to get people better grades would be to put them in easier courses. And we also have evidence that being in easier courses is actually worse for, 
for success down the road. So kind of my bottom line here is that we ought to think of maybe grades as a, as a primary indicator, but use tests as a check on, on grade inflation, a check that people actually know something and that the predictive, the strong predictive power of grades that we've seen in the research doesn't go away because of behavior by policymakers and practitioners. So just to wrap up with a kind of a couple of recommendations that I think come out of this, this way of thinking about the, the college uh, academic preparation issue is that first we ought to assess high schools with more than one year of test scores and graduation rates, which is what you know, we, we currently do under, under federal law. We could also think about courses taken and performance in those courses, once again in the, the right structure where there's not too much incentive to kind of get these things out of whack. Second, we ought to think about ways to increase enrollment in rigorous courses for students who can benefit from taking them. Um, and finally, we ought to look for opportunities for more collaborations between researchers and practitioners to pilot interventions aimed at improving success in high school courses. Learn more. What is it? What kinds of interventions can help people be successful? And what, what effects do those have both in that course and down the road? And there was a, a study that came out, I think, in the last couple of years of intensive tutoring in Chicago having extremely large effects on the ac outcomes of uh, students who were previously very far behind academically. So appreciate the attention and look forward to the discussion. Great, terrific, man. Um, hey, just want to hit you guys with a couple of questions, a couple of things that I'm curious about, and then we'll open it up to give you a question to the audience. Tara, first off, so college choices matter. When you, so we talk about helping students make better choices of college. What are you thinking of? Well, I'm thinking of actually giving them data-driven information on the differences in uh, and how they're likely to, uh, to do at different institutions and uh, to help them understand essentially net price and quality. Ask a kid, as we've done in some sur survey data, do they want to go to the best college that they can get into? It's very rare that you'll find a kid or their parents that say anything other than they want the, they want the best college for them. And then you look at the data and you see that the, that, the, that the best is an institution with a very low graduation rate. So I don't think that the problem is that kids or their parents don't want to attend good schools. They probably don't have a good sense of what the indicators are. Now, what's a good school uh, is going to, to vary enormously across individuals and sending... A uh, kid with median SATs, lots of information about Harvard, is uh, not a very productive way to address the situation. So what you want um, are customized, personalized, relevant data, and some front-end tools to help students use those data. The back-end data are fairly massive, uh, it, it, as you can see from looking at college scorecard. You actually probably do need a PhD in political science or economics to work with all those data. But how do we make those easy for a student and his or her family to use? Now, on, on, on like, say the, sorry, the, the Harvard, no, but like on the Harvard point, for instance, right? Um, I can't forget what you guys was talking about, right? There's this joint effect, which is both the individuals who go to the institutions, and, and I think Sarah, you about this, and the things that the institutions do. Now, at Harvard, right, it seems like a safe bet that a lot of these kids would probably complete their degree at any it's number really of institutions. It's really hard to not... Uh, uh, I right. mean, look... And especially having spent a lot of time... <laughs> having spent a lot of time up there, right, the, the idea that they're doing anything particularly helpful or constructive in classrooms seems uh, debatable at best. So there's... <laughs> Uh, but, but so when we think about, when we try to think about the right fit for a student, the right institution, how do we think about which part is institutions are doing good jobs in terms of supporting all students and which is just that institutions are getting in students who are likely to graduate wherever they happen to go to college? So there, I think there are a couple of pieces uh, to your question. So first in terms of fit. I don't think, you know, a, a really important piece of this is individual choice. We need to give you information to figure out what the best fit for you is. Not, I don't, you know, uh, I think we'd all push back on the notion of, of telling a student what the best match is or assigning students to institutions. Uh, and so that, that's about arming a student and his family with the tools to assess match quality. Now there's a question in terms of the return on the, the non-trivial public and private dollars that go into institutions. Uh, that is, if you will, what is the value added of Harvard 
uh, versus what is the fact that it just does a really good job of selecting smart young people uh, who would have done well uh, in, in any event. And that, you know, the latter question is, is really quite challenging empirically. It's something that I think, you know, you know Carolyn Hoxby's done a great deal to try and uh, get at that question. Uh, it's, you know, it's not an altogether easy question empirically because it begs this question of what's the outcome you want to look at. Do you mm. want to look at world leaders or earnings or, you know, uh, again, it's a tough question. Matt, well, when you talk about um, grades is something that we obviously ought to be thinking about in terms of both being predicted for students and then large, about whether high school's doing a good job, right? One immediately says, all right, there's some lawmakers out there who've heard the Chingo's talk. They go, what we need is our high schools to give higher grades to students. And if your high school's giving less than a 3.6, clearly there's something wrong. We can imagine all the ways that right. would play. How do we think about not taking the insight that you've offered and then doing a Campbell's Law kind of corruption of it by starting to push schools to give higher grades. So that's where I think the test can be really useful, right? So if you're a state that has pretty good end of course tests that are used in, in high school courses that you want to target, um, well, maybe that's more part of the accountability measure for the schools because they're not going to be able to game that, right? Um, and, and then, but I think you're right. It's a, it's a tricky thing to think about if you want to create incentives for high schools to teach students not just how to do well on the end of course of test and to know the material, but to show up every day and do that kind of stuff, well then that's going to be, going to be a lot harder, right? Because we know it's predictive, we know that there's something in there that we want schools to be promoting, uh, but uh, if we just hold them accountable for the outcome, the outcome isn't tied closely enough and it's too kind of, too, too gameable, right, to just increase, increase you grades. Know, and say a bit more about I, I, the cut score point you make about the continuum is really interesting. Um, in the body mass analogies. So take that a step further. If you're a policymaker and you're, you've got people coming to you talking about the cut scores matter and we've got to make sure students are equipped before they go to college, what's the right and the wrong way to read your slide about what, what the continuum looks like in terms of college preparedness? I think the right way to think about it is we want people with more preparedness, right? And if we have a measure like a you know, score on a on a test that we think is a good measure of, of, of readiness, we ought to want to know do more people have higher scores over time. And one simple way is to say, well, you want to above a certain score, and what percent are above the certain score? But then that obviously that ignores any movement above and below that cutoff. So the other way to think about it, which maybe some people find conceptually a little harder, is how does the average score change over time? So it's not so much I think it's bad to say we want to know what share are above some cutoff, and you know what the ACT folks like to do is to say, What's the score that would give you at least a 50% chance of achieving some target GPA? So that's kind of something people can wrap their minds away. So as, an, as a presentational tool, that's fine. Um, but I think for people who are actually you know, kind of in the classroom doing this work, we don't want them to think that, oh, I get my kid to a 23 on the SAT, and I've succeeded. Right? We, we don't want to send that kind of message. We want to send the message that if you get to a kid to a 23, getting them to a 24, it's just as important as getting some other kid from a 22 to a 23. There's nothing magical about that. that uh, that, that cutoff. And I don't think the folks who use these cutoffs would say that there's something magical about it, but I think it could be interpreted that way. Mm. Uh, Cody, let's uh, go ahead and open it up uh, for questions. If folks uh, who want to ask a question would be kind enough to just identify themselves by name and affiliation, and would be kind enough to actually ask a question. Uh, <laughs> if, we're, if we're 15 seconds in, I don't spot a question coming, we'll give somebody else a shot. Yes, sir. Hi, Adam Seiner from the Fordham Institute. Uh, I think this focus on uh, preparation and, and um, academic preparation is really important, but I'm a little confused about the idea of predictive, uh, what is predictive? So it, we know half of kids drop out of, out of college, and we think that has to do with a lot of them not being prepared, which I think is the point of, of the paper. But if a student is looking at their own academic profile and they're getting ready to go to college, we know a lot of them aren't prepared, and then they're looking at their grades and they're looking at their test scores, we would say, as kind of from a statistical mindset, okay, grades are more predictive than test scores. But we know, because of grade inflation, that that distribution of grades has gotten squashed so that most kids are getting three point something. 
that sounds like a good grade. So should a student who's thinking about going to college and thinking about what their future is going to be, should they be looking at how did I do on the SAT or the ACT? Or should they be saying, oh, I got a 3.3, that sounds pretty good, so I'm ready for college? I think the extent of grade inflation has probably been exaggerated in, in some sense. I mean, I, I imagine it matters more at the upper end. I mean, we spent some time at Harvard. I mean, there's sort of rampant grade inflation there. And right, maybe at the kind of schools that are sending people to fancy colleges, there's been a lot of grade inflation. So, you know, a 3.5 isn't what it used to be. Um, but if you look at the kind of the broader picture of the, of the country, there's lots of people still failing, failing their high school courses because if you don't show up, they don't pass you. Well, we're in D.C., so maybe I <laughs> shouldn't say that. But, uh, but, uh, but the, the truth is there's sort of pr predictive value there. So I guess it's not so much I'm saying that, you know, a kid with a 3.9 versus a 3.7 should make some big inference based on that. But if there's a kid who is kind of a reliable B student, kind of showing up every day doing the work um, and didn't get such a great score in the SAT or ACT and that kid came to me for advice, you know, should I take a risk, take out some loans, go to college, I'd probably say, yeah, you, sh you, sh you should do it. You've been able to, you know, kind of cut it in high school, even if you're, you know, not shooting out the lights, you should do it. Whereas if someone comes to me and said, you know, I've missed half my classes and I have a 1.6 GPA and I'm barely going to graduate with the minimum requirements, but, you know, I got to score at the 80th percentile on the SAT, like, smart, I'd say, well, you know, maybe you have the potential to be successful, but you, your track record suggests you have a, kind of have a hard time showing up and doing the kinds of things it would take to succeed in college. Sarah, on the flip side of this, it, one can read your slide about the 600,000 students at institutions that graduate fewer than 20%. Yeah. And is one, of the, is one of the implications that those institutions should should rethink whether they're saying yes to all of these students? Do we want them to say to some students, we don't think you're going to complete, this isn't the right place for you? I try to steer away from the should part, the, the, the normative, uh, whether they should or shouldn't, but certainly what they're doing at present uh, is not a good match for the students, uh, would be where I'd... I'd come out on that. So either, either they need to be doing something different in how they're working with students or they should, or they should say no. Uh, but you know, how they resolve that is an internal institutional question. But it, you know, again, I'm going to come back to this notion with any of these students that we have a responsibility to make clear that college isn't a spectator sport, and indeed college can make you worse off uh, if you take on $5,000 worth of debt and don't get any credit hours. And sometimes I think that the messaging that comes through in the public environment emphasizes the upside without being honest about the downside. Mm. Cody. Hi, Sean Riley with the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Thanks for uh, holding this event. Uh, so um, it seems like one uh, factor that maybe you didn't address, or you kind of did, but but not directly, is um, the, the the populations that schools uh, cater to. So you mentioned that schools that are more selective, you know, they can sort of game those numbers in, in, in that way. But um, select, so there's, but there seems to be some kind of a trade-off between access and completion in some sense. And so uh, schools that are less selective will probably have a higher uh, rate of non-completion and schools that maybe even op uh, honor an open enrollment, um, you know, are obviously going to have, have an even less uh, uh, completion rate. So, um, and so, can you just comment on that? The, the trade-off in the sec second part is the new iPads data that was recent. iPads recently changed the way that it collects data uh, to include not just uh, first-time, full-time students. So, will that p potentially change the data that as a going forward? So, I, mean, I think if you put, put up a chart, I mean, you showed us a chart where I think at resources and graduation yeah. rates, you can do average SAT, ACT scores and graduation rates. What you see is there's a relationship, right? The places with stronger peer groups, more resources, have higher graduation rates. But except at the very top where everyone graduates, everywhere else there's a lot of variation, right? So for a level of resources or for a, a certain amount of peer group composition, there's, there's a huge amount of variation there. So clearly there's something 
going on at the institutions that matters. And, and on the second point, yeah, I mean, I think obviously being limited to first time, full time is a big limitation of, of these data. And I think the new iPad stuff is certainly a helpful step in the right direction. But it's kind of hard to think about if you want to compare different colleges that have very different missions and are serving very different groups of students, I'm not sure if there's any number that could put on equal or comparable footing a college that's all first-time, full-time people and a college that's all transfer students because those are different groups of people yeah. who are going to, you're going to expect them to take different, to have different patterns, expect them to have different amounts of time to completion. So on one hand, we need the information on the people who are not first-time, full-time, but we also have to be careful and not just lumping it all together and saying we've solved the problem. I think Matt, Matt, Matt kicked that one out of the park. Cool. Um, one related question, though. You, you alluded to the unintended consequences piece, which seems to come into play here. I mean, one of the things that has long seemed characteristic of elite institutions is you have to work really hard not to graduate. Exactly. Um, is, that, is that what we're pushing for at open access institutions? We want them to... Do we, do, how do we avoid a mindset where they are saying, look, unless you really screw up and don't show up, you're going to pass this course. As long as you just keep showing up and sitting in a seat, you're going to wind up with a diploma. I mean, I don't think that's what any of us intend. So how do we push, how do we elevate college completion without pushing kind of, we're going to hand diplomas out like a Pez dispenser? So I, I think that this comes back to the, a lot of the lessons learned in the K-12 and environment on accountability, where pushing one measure too hard rather than thinking about a portfolio of measures is what gets you in this situation with rampant gaming. So, you know, again, in the K-12, you know, social promotion, some form of social promotion or cheating on a test or something like that. You want to avoid that. So you want to have, again, a group, have it be not just graduation rates, but other outcomes. You also want to understand, you want to, if you will, control for institutional circumstances, institutions that are serving a higher proportion of poor students uh, that are less well prepared should be held to a different standard than Harvard. Uh, uh, you know, so I think you can use multiple measures. You can use controls for institutional population to, if you will, to um, avoid some of the extreme consequences, which again are really twofold when you're thinking about graduation rates. They're either this notion of producing degree mills. Or, uh, you know, on the flip side, denying opportunity in the form of extreme cream skimming. Neither, carried to the extreme, neither of those are, are desirable, certainly. All right. Cody. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Mesquita. I'm here with um, Leadership Enterprise for a Diverse America. Um, so... What's um, sort of interesting to me about this research, and um, I really love that you brought up um, preparation as a major issue, is um, it kind of feels like the conversation is really putting the onus on students and families um, to one, understand the data, and to determine what is the be a good fit or the best school to go to. Um, my perspective is that uh, preparation is also really dependent on, you know, having those rigorous courses and having people that are prepared and able and have the resources to teach those courses. And I guess I'm interesting to, interested to know if there is any substantial data on teachers, um, how, they, how they teach, um, is there any, like, metric, um, any way to measure their performance or how well they're doing at teaching these um, more rigorous courses, um, because I know, you know, from experience that this is uh, a huge issue in low-performing, low socioeconomic schools. So, Matt, um, when you're talking about having students do more rigorous coursework, uh, probably developing some of these skills also that translate, what do we know about how teachers are, you know, teacher variability in terms of how good they are at this stuff? Right. So, from the K-12 research, we know there's quite a bit of variability in, in, in teacher quality. Uh, and it is captured by different measures. So, uh, so Bo Jackson has a has a new working paper out, uh, looking at ninth grade uh, classes, I think in I think math classes, and looking at teacher effects on test scores, and then teacher effects on kind of an index of more behavioral kinds of things. 
and finds that teachers vary in both of those things. They're not that highly correlated. Right? A lot of the teachers who are good at raising test scores aren't good at raising the other stuff and, and vice versa. Um, and the other, it's the other stuff, not the test score stuff, that seems to be most predictive of things later on, like, like, like going to college. So I think teachers are important. And I'm also glad you brought up the point about uh, access to courses, right? Because obviously, we're talking about as we want to get more people into courses, we're sort of assuming they exist. But in a lot of cases, they, they don't exist. So some colleagues of mine at the Urban Institute recently put out a piece calculating using Office of Civil Rights data for the whole country access to calculus by, by race and ethnicity and found that students of color don't often are in high schools that just don't offer calculus. So we can't be telling kids take calculus if, they're, if their school isn't, isn't offering it. Um, so clearly, that's a big, that, that margin is potentially important. Let me jump into the, on a piece of this question that goes beyond actual academic achievement, but is still part of college preparation, which is there are huge differences across high schools in the level of college preparation resources. If you're in a Fairfax high school, you've probably uh, taken the PSAT more than once, sometimes as many as three times. It's a, you probably have to have a letter from your mother to not take the test. If you're in many of our Southwest Virginia districts, it's an opt-in process. You, they're going to make you actually make up the work after school that you missed while you took the PSAT. So there are very big differences in access, and that's a, a, and I want to think about the PSAT as a symbol of uh, you know just the general college preparation culture, where the high school that you attend is going to is likely going to differ greatly in terms of those resources that are there to help you guide a choice. Perfect. Matt, Sarah, thank you guys so much for a terrific conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Lene. Oh, Cody, do we five now? Ten minute break, and we will reconvene. Somebody has to know these things.
All right, folks, we're going to get started. If you could take your seats, we're going to bring up our second panel. I assume green means forward, but I don't really know. Folks, I'm going to ask you to take your seats. We're going to get started. Clearly, I need a glass to ting. All right, thanks for coming back and joining us. We have had a lot of conversation about um, different kinds of indications that students may or may not complete and also um, uh, kind of the landscape of college completion. But what we haven't talked about a ton yet is the factors that institutions might be able to control that would drive college completion and, and the ways that policymakers might be able to incentivize institutions to use those tools and and those interventions more robustly than they are right now. So I'm very excited to have a couple of people who are expert on that to talk a little bit about that topic with us today. Um, we have uh, Kim Clark with us, who is an assistant director of the Education Writers Association. Um, she used to work for Money Magazine and US News and World Report, and she created financialaidletter.com, which was the first site to post actual financial aid letters to show just how confusing they are and how difficult it is for students to make those smart college choices that we've been talking about. Um, and she wrote uh, the paper that was entitled Completion Reforms That Work, um, How Leading Colleges Are Improving in Attainment of High-Value Degrees. So I'm excited to hear um, all of the good advice that she has for us. And then we also have Mesmin Destin, who is an associate professor at Northwestern University. Um, he investigates social psych psychological mechanisms underlying socioeconomic disparities in educational outcomes during adolescence and young adult adulthood. And he studies the factors that influence young people um, and how they perceive both of themselves and of the future and kind of what their, um, what they, their future, futures might hold. And so he wrote a paper about how that impacts um, college completion called Leveraging Psychological Factors a necessary component to improving student outcomes. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Kim to talk a little bit about hers. Okay, thanks. Am I on? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so you're going to hear today a lot about creating incentives and policies, but the actual hard work of giving students the higher education, this post-secondary skills and credentials they need to succeed in life is done at the individual level of individual institutions, individual instructors, individual counselors. And so that was the task that uh, you folks gave us. And I want to say that my lead and co-author, Mark Schneider, is not here today. He told me to say he's busy. So, <laughs> so that's fine. So um, I'm trying to, I've been trying to sort of uh, channel my inner, inner Mark Schneider for you. <laughs> so um, if there are any reporters here, any misstatements are mine. If they're just my interpretation of Mark. So that they're, but they're my fault. Uh, let's see. So uh, in channeling Mark, I guess the one thing I wanted to say is this research was actually surprisingly difficult because there was so little good, rigorous research of all of the college success programs and initiatives that you see around the country. If you go to any college, take any college tour right now, um, you'll get um, somebody bragging about a living learning community or a summer bridge program or some sort of counseling program. But they are, And this will be at research universities, but they will have almost no rigorous research indicating whether or not those programs are actually moving students through graduation and into success in life. Um, I will give one example, and Mark would probably name the college, but I'll be more polite, and I won't. Um, 
that I talked to uh, the director of a program uh, at a school that had a very good uh, graduation rate for uh, first generation students, and he was running the first generation program. And I said, "Well, you know, what's your data? What show me, you know, what you what you're doing?" And he said, "Well, all the students who go to our program for air, all four years graduate." <laughs> that was his data. See, we're we're succeeding. So they they had no idea of actually looking at well, what about the people who started and and didn't finish? What happened to them, right? So. So what we did was we limited our research and our findings to programs that had at least some data um, that indicated that it actually was working and it wasn't just sort of a, a random data blip here. So, okay, so we found five basic promising reforms. And um, the first one is sort of, a, I'll go like this, duh. Okay, make more room for disadvantaged kids at the schools that already have track records of doing a great job. So there's something called the American Talent Initiative, and it has, I think, at least 100 uh, colleges. That, on their website, they have 100. They said um, that uh, you have, to belong, you have to have a graduation rate of at least 70% to this, um, to this initiative. And their aim is to add 50,000 seats for disadvantaged students by, I think, oh, 2025, right? Um, this is a very expensive program. If you add a, a full-pay student, I mean, a, a, a student who needs a full ride to Amherst, that's another... You know, Amherst says that's about a $90,000 cost to them. Um, but it has huge advantages. The research does show that, for, especially for first generation or minorities, the advantages to those students is very high. Um, I think it was Kruger who found that um, those students do tend to graduate, much more, are much more likely to graduate, and do very well in the job market. There's, a, I think, a 12% annual earnings premium, which is pretty remarkable. Um, the problem with this idea is it's really not very scalable. Um, 50,000 students is about 2% of the undergraduate population, so it's not going to have a huge impact. Secondly, um, a lot of the schools that are, have joined this initiative, you know, with good intentions, if you look at their current records of uh, enabling success for disadvantaged or minority students, it's not so great. Um, um, I'm going to call out one school just because I remember it, not to pick on them. Is anybody here from Juniata, a small school in Pennsylvania? So um, they have a, they, just as an example, there are many schools like it. I'm not picking on them, really. But the graduation rate for African Americans at that school is much lower than it is for the white students. So these schools, just because they express this, con, you know, this desire to help, they really have some work to do themselves uh, in helping, making sure that the students who they do enroll are going to graduate because if you look at the minority graduation rate at some of these schools, it's much less than 70%. So, okay, but expanding from that, uh, some schools have actually sort of taken that idea of you know why do schools like Amherst have a have a great graduation rate? Well, they provide great financial aid, they have great instructors, they have lots of counseling. So providing that all-around package to disadvantaged students, I mean, it's kind of obvious that it would work, and it does. And this is one of the very few programs that has been proven in a very rigorous, random controlled study to work. Uh, CUNY has uh, providing full financial aid, lots of tutoring, and lots of counseling to literally thousands of students now. And by next year, it's going to be 25,000 students through its SEEK and ASAP programs. Now, ASAP started in the community college, and SEEK is for the senior colleges. Um, it costs more because you have to provide more aid, you have to provide more tutoring, you have to provide more counseling. It's about, depending on what year you look at their data, anywhere from $2,700 per student per year to as much as $5,000. But if you change the accounting, if you start to think of the cost per graduated student or cost per credential, it's much less expensive. Um, some research found that it was about $6,500 less for graduated student at, I think, um, ASAP than it was than, than, than for the regular students who supposedly have lower cost uh, instruction. Um, and it, not only the students finish faster, so their costs are lower, but they tend to, since they are much more likely to earn a credential, they're much more likely to earn more. Um, and the, SEEK, the um, CLIMB initiative found that the SEEK alumni found were earning $4,000 more than their peers. So that's per year. So that's that's a very that's a program that is proven to work. Um, they're now in sort of replication studies in other states in Ohio and I think California. So 
Um, this, is, this is one of the most promising programs, I think, in the country. Um, OK. Um, we all know there's not enough financial aid. It's just not enough. But some schools are trying to fill in those gaps sort of in a possibly lower cost way by just providing just-in-time emergency grants or completion grants. And Georgia State University is kind of leading the pack on this. Um, they've already made more than 10,000 uh, completion grants, which is what happens is if you're a junior or senior and you're in good standing but you just haven't registered because you have an unpaid bill, they'll go in and just wipe out your tuition bill. And their average, their average uh, grant for this is just $900. It's not very expensive. But it's had a huge impact on keeping students in the school. And um, Tim Rennick, who's the, I think the provost there, said that, um, that he thinks that they're actually making money on the deal. Because if the student registers for that next semester, then hopefully they'll register for the semester after. And they're actually collecting additional revenue over the next year or two um, that more than makes up for the $900. So he, he thinks that if you looked on a net basis, they're actually doing OK. Again, no true rigorous study to confirm this. That's imp his impression. Um, but um, GSU has sort of famously dramatically increased its graduation rate and dramatically increased the number of students that it's graduating. Um, we, again, there's no official study connecting these two programs, but the data is pretty clear that something they're doing is right, and this is a program that, that seems, to, seems to be effective. Um, OK. Um, we all know about big data, um, and lots of, there are lots of uh, consultants and companies out there who are trying to sell programs to uh, colleges, you know, claiming that if they mine their data, they'll, they'll identify or flag the students who uh, need, need advising. Um, uh, this, this idea has a very mixed record. There have been some remarkable examples of success, and Cal State Fullerton is an example. Um, they just hired advisors, and their only job was just to call every single person, student in good standing, who had failed to register for the next quarter. That's all that, you know, just call, what's the problem, how can we help you? And it made a huge difference in their retention rate, their graduation rate, and the number of uh, uh, degrees they've awarded. Um, it's not horribly expensive given the, um, given the results that they've gotten. Um, Again, they, 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 this, there's been no randomized study of this, but it, the, the data seemed pretty clear on this. Um, okay. And um, the last thing we're going to talk about is using evidence-based teaching methods. And um, we cited a couple of examples, both science, I mean, we can talk about the science, using science instruction, uh, improving science instruction, but one of the most important ways, uh, aspects that needs changing is, is remedial education. I mean, in some states, remedial education math courses have pass rates of 12%. So these are students who are never going to make it onto college credit if they can't pass remedial math, right? And those courses are obviously not helping those students. So there have been a variety of efforts to change, change remedial education. Um, one is called quant ways and stat ways. And um, in California, for example, they've basically um, just decided to offer what are called co-requisites, which is um, the student takes the regular college course, but then they get extra you know, tutoring and support. Um, and um, there's been a lot of evidence that the co-requisites really do help uh, dramatically improve pass rates. Um, in ten Tennessee's community colleges, uh, the pass rate went from 12% to more than 50%, which is pretty remarkable. Um, again, there's been no long, not yet, there haven't been long-term findings showing whether those students are in fact progressing and succeeding in college graduating, whether those co-requisites are enough to really help them graduate and move on to a good, uh, good uh, situation in the job market. But it looks very promising. Um, okay, so four big lessons from all of these. There is no simple plug-and-play solution. Uh, lots of programs like, you know, we just send a simple text message and we get you know, more retention. It, when, they, when people try to spread these out, it turns out that at one college, text messages work. At another college, emails work. At another third college, nothing works. So there's no simple, like, plug and play solution. Um, second big takeaway is short-term programs have short-term effects. A lot of people have looked at summer bridge programs and so on. And those are great while they're in place. 
but there's no evidence that they make a global impact, a significant impact on long-term uh, benefits for the students. I mean, they, they do work over the short, short term. Um, generally, just sort of an obvious solution, um, idea is holistic be to pe piecemeal. I mean, you can increase financial aid, but if you don't also increase the advising and the tutoring, you're not going to get as much a, of, a, of a bang for your buck. Um, and finally, improving educational quality saves money. Um, so we just have to sort of change our mindset about accounting. Instead of looking at the cost per credit or the cost per course, let's start to take a look at the cost per graduated student, right? And suddenly, investments in quality turn out to be much, actually money saving rather than expensive. So. Thank you. All right, I, I really appreciate that work because I know it's so difficult to catalog all the things that universities are doing and it's so rare and important. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about is these psychological factors that are key to uh, improving student outcomes and sustaining the positive student outcomes for students who are actually enrolled in college but at risk of not completing. Uh, and it really makes sense that for me to follow what you just shared about all these institutional practices because you know there's all this evidence about the resources, the financial resources that are important to invest in institutions, in students to support positive outcomes, the different types of evidence-based and um, innovative teaching practices that have been shown to have positive outcomes for students, uh, and holistic supports in general uh, that follow students across a range of their experiences. But what, as a psychologist um, studying the effects of these psychological factors, what we find time and time again is that all of these efforts uh, can really be supplemented if they take into account the subjective experience of the individual students who are trying to navigate all of these systems and all of these resources. Uh, and if they, they are not taken into account sort of how they're experiencing subjectively all of these efforts, um, they can often sort of fall flat in terms of these attempted investments. So this is a way to sort of maximize on investments that institutions are already making. Uh, so another way of thinking about that is that these institutional practices and policies can influence learning and ac academic outcomes and college completion uh, and often function through the ways that they're experienced by students or a range of psychological factors. And how do they inadvertently convey to students that the institution uh, believes that they can actually succeed there? Uh, and they feel supported there, which we have seen time and time again to encourage student motivation and persistence so that they actually can make it through all the challenges that they encounter through college. And the number of factors, a couple of key factors I kind of zoned in on within this particular paper, uh, we can wrap around the, the titles of motives and mindsets. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit and describe what I mean by that and some evidence on why these factors matter uh, and what are the recommendations based on that for a large scale for institutions. Uh, but first, I also want to sort of foreground a couple of misconceptions that make it difficult sometimes to think about psychological factors in terms of how they can have meaningful effects for students. I think one first uh, initial misconception is that psychological effects uh, that you sometimes see of these interventions are, are small and just a drop in the bucket of a bigger issue and not really meaningful or important. And so it's, it's useful that there are more larger scale studies that are showing randomized control trials of the meaningful impact that are long term of specifically targeted psychological effects and how they can be incorporated into what institutions are doing in a meaningful way. The other misconception that you often run into is that psychological effects are about sort of coddling students and distracting them away from or sort of clearing away difficulty so that things are just easier and they make it through. Uh, but a true understanding of what we're trying to tap into in a lot of these, uh, these studies and approaches um, indicates that you're trying to get students to approach challenges and difficulties and to see them as meaningful and to persist through them rather than to clear any sort of way for them. So first, this notion of motives. Uh, when I refer to motives, um, thinking about students' thoughts about what matters to them and who they might become in life. And, and there are hundreds of studies of how different motives are influential to keep students persisting through college uh, and before college as well. Uh, and you've heard these referred to as goals, expectations, values, sometimes identities, or students' future identities in experiments and in correlational studies, tapping into students' motives and in different ways throughout the educational experience keeps them tapped in and um, connected so they persist through all sorts of challenges. 
So in, in one study, for example, uh, with about hundreds of students in major courses, in large courses, uh, the experimenters wanted to see if they could make the content feel more connected to students' motives. The same content, just a little experimental manipulation to see if you could improve outcomes by connecting what's going on to students' actual um, goals, motives, and identities, and what matters to them. So before key assignments and exams within the course, some students were randomly assigned to do a writing activity uh, that was designed to have them think about what they're studying in connection to what matters to them. Just a simple uh, but psychologically designed way to draw this important connection between motives and class content compared to control groups that didn't do these same types of writing activities. And what they found is significant and meaningful improvements, increases in student performance on each of those writing, each of those assignments and exams if they were randomly assigned to do these particular writing tasks. So much so that at the end of the course, uh, particularly for students from underrepresented minority groups, there was a major increase in their grades over the course of the semester within the particular courses. Uh, and this effect uh, turned out to play out in the in way of a 61% reduction and the gap in course grades between students from majority groups and from underrepresented minority groups who are at the greatest risk of not completing. And what's important that I'm going to repeat over and over again is that these findings are compelling, but they don't suggest that this specific writing activity is something that all classes or all institutions should do and take and just institute without thought. The idea is that if you thoughtfully craft in um, activities and practices at the institutional level that use these insights from psychological and behavioral science in ways that are tailored to the particular context, then you can systematically improve student outcomes over time. The other sort of area where there's a lot of research and dozens of studies showing a connection to student persistence and outcomes uh, are on this idea of mindset and this notion that uh, how much do students believe that, that personal qualities like intelligence are stable and fixed and unchanging? Or do they sort of believe that a person's intelligence can change, develop, and grow, a notion of a growth mindset? And that experiencing difficulty in academic contexts is a normal part of belonging and other people feel it within that environment. Uh, so as much as all of these, this, this idea of having more of, a, of an approach towards challenge and growth and a feeling of belonging is associated with better student outcomes, a key part of this whole picture is that these mindsets aren't just something that students bring along with them and they don't change themselves over time. They're constantly shaped by what's going on in the environment. So the institution, by all the different practices that it's engaging in at multiple levels, are reinforcing a notion to students either that you, are, uh, you have an ability to develop in this context and you belong here, or you don't belong and you either can make it or you can't make it. And there are all sorts of ways that you can think about institutions sending those messages when they're everyday practices. One um, larger scale experiment in this area was an experiment with thousands of students uh, who were finishing high school uh, and enrolling in a range of different types of colleges. And they were randomly assigned to do online modules that were designed to convey one of these messages um, that people can develop and improve their intelligence over time, uh, and that students belong within academic contexts even though they experience difficulty uh, compared to control groups. And what they found in these experiments is that after the end of their first academic year enrolling in college, students were significantly more likely in these, one of these experimental treatments to remain enrolled than if they were in a control group. Again, with this small experimental module, um, you see a significant effect, which is meaningful, but doesn't suggest that this particular module is something that should be taken everywhere in the same type of way. It provides evidence that this message is powerful and can be incorporated in systematic ways um, throughout a student's college experience. So to, and this, this showed a 40% reduction in the college persistence gap between students from disadvantaged groups and advantaged groups economically. So to take these uh, sort of insights from particular types of studies on motives and mindsets and think about ways that you can see them playing out within institutions, one way is to think about all the different levels of influence and the different ways that institutions are trying to shape student experiences. From the broader institutional policies to practices in the, in the classroom and faculty practices uh, and what's going on with peers and their everyday interactions. Uh, so at the sort of broader institutional level, you know, we heard about the importance of having financial resources and making sure that students have what they need to actually um, you know, continue to stay in college financially. And at the same time, to even further amplify the positive effects of those approaches and those resources, 
uh, financial aid counseling can normalize the experience of financial aid so that students know it's actually a part of succeeding in the institution and draw connections between what they're, what they're receiving, like taking out loans and this sort of daunting experience and the future goals and how it's important to actually finish and to reach those goals rather than to not really know how this aid plays out or to receive a really confusing letter that doesn't tell you what this aid means for you and your motives. And this sends a psychological message that the institution is supportive of your motives uh, and that it's supportive of students from a range of diverse backgrounds. And we see in many experimental studies that these types of messages increase persistence for students and increase their motivation to stay within that context. At the faculty and classroom level, um, there are a number of ways that the recruitment and development of faculty um, can encourage innovative teaching practices and uh, like project-based learning uh, rather than practices that only convey that some students have the answers and others don't and there's no way to develop and grow. Um, these are the types of practices that tell students that you can embrace challenge, um, you can have difficult experiences and you continue to develop as a class together. And that makes more students remain connected to the endeavor rather than to feel that they're unable to actually you know, rise to the task. And finally, at the peer level, uh, all these interactions that students are having with each other all the time, we often don't capture in research this, this huge part of their experience. Uh, and an important range of programs can happen as students are beginning, connecting uh, first-year students with peer mentors that have advanced, uh, back, that are sort of advanced within their experience, but also come from similar and diverse backgrounds. And we see studies that having these formed connections early on convey the message that students from many different backgrounds succeed within the institution and that they belong despite all the challenges that they ran into. Um, so all of these can be incorporated in unique and creative ways uh, by people who are working on an everyday basis on institutional practices and all sorts of policies to have these sustained and holistic effects for student persistence and well-being. Um, to a couple of notes that I want to, to raise as well in, in taking all of this into account. Uh, is one, is there's, there's a temptation, I think, to try to measure some of these factors that are predictive and attach sort of high stakes to them, which can clearly go a very sort of undesirable direction uh, where you have people just trying to get students to circle the right bubbles on a survey rather than actually have a positive effect on the institutional climate. And furthermore, our measures of some of these psychological factors really depend on the, the context itself and can't always be taken one to the next without consideration of how the context is different. Um, so always sort of adjusting to that is important and not falling into the sort of easiest high stakes approach. The next uh, is that all of these approaches uh, tend to have positive effects for all students or at least don't have any negative effects for particular students. So a universal sort of facilitation could be beneficial, but sometimes the effects are strongest for students who are from underrepresented minority groups or students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and targeted approaches uh, are sometimes desired. But if that's the case, being extremely thoughtful about how to target certain students with particular types of supports and resources is extremely important um, because targeting students without the right approach can convey a message that we don't expect you to succeed here where it's actually stigmatizing and has very strong backfire effects if not done carefully. Uh, and finally, of course, I think continuing an ongoing research and evaluation is necessary to get a better sense of all the things that institutions are doing that do or do not tie into what we know about psychological factors that affect students and get a sense of how these different factors can be translated in a range of wider contexts to support um, better outcomes across the spectrum. All right. Thank you. I have to say, when I read the two of your papers, I felt quite optimistic because it felt like there are things we can actually do in order to improve college completion. And it felt less like kind of demographics are destiny. And if you are a certain kind of person, you're just not going to succeed or a certain kind of institution, you're, you can't do anything about your, your completion rates. So if I gave each of you a magic wand and you could do one thing to make more institutions do the kinds of things that we're now talking about that do have these impacts, what would you use it to do? I'll, I'll start, because that's the, that's the danger question for, for this approach, because it's often seen as trying to give a magic answer that fixes mm -hmm. everything, and that's, that's really not what any of these little individual things can do. But I will say 
that um, a colleague, Mary Murphy, recently put it this way, and that there are many places where there are, psycho there are points of psychological friction mm -hmm. for students along their path through college, where you know when you get the admission letter, it doesn't match sort of uh, a sense of where you're headed in life, or when you receive your financial aid letter, or when you get put on probation. There are all these things that can be adjusted in a different type of way. So if there are, someone earlier suggested research practice partnerships, which I think is a great idea. If you can actually have researchers embedded within institutions mm. or utilized better by institutions where they're already embedded um, to, ta to redesign the experience and all of these psychological friction points, then you can at least tap into um, the factors that we have focused on. But I think there are a range of other, other I things. I think that's great. Yeah. Embedding the research is terrific. But, um, since, I, since I'm sort of a big fan of the CUNY programs, I guess, I guess to get colleges to start to look at things like that, I, I think you have to change the accounting or, or time period that, that, that colleges are looking at. If they were paid by the degree or if they you know, did the accounting by the degree, they would automatically make these investments because it would save them money. So. Um, I guess changing the, the accounting, I know that sounds really boring, but changing the accounting could make a huge difference. Yeah. And what do you think is the biggest barrier right now that stops institutions from investing in these kinds of programs that when we see just with the impact? I would say short-term short thinking. Yeah. You know, a president is there for three years and he's got to make an impact right away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think also um, there's resistance to acknowledging a problem oftentimes mm. um, and really showing hard numbers of what's going wrong is really necessary to, to motivate some institutions that something has to change because mm -hmm. business as usual can continue um, without affecting some of the people sort of in charge. But if a brighter light is shown on sort of what's happening to so many students, mm -hmm. uh, I think that could go a long way to sort of motivating real change and to actually evaluate if the the efforts are really effective or they're just something to sort of put a band-aid and feel like you're trying. Yeah. I would also add either tradition or entropy. I mean, mm -hmm. when you look at the changes that are needed to be made, you mentioned project-based learning, which, mm -hmm. you know, the research indicates is actually very successful, mm -hmm. but it means that you no longer have the sage on a stage, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the work that Carl Wyman has been doing to try to change the way science is taught. Um, you know, he's. He's won a Nobel Prize and nobody's listening to him, right? So, <laughs> so I mean, th there are efforts to actually change the way we teach based on research on how people learn. Uh, but I think a lot of, especially the faculty, really like the way they used to do it. Mm. So changing that is really hard. And obviously, we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., so a lot of our conversation is um, often targeted towards the policy, how we can use federal policy in particular, but even state policy to drive institutions to look at some of these questions. Mm -hmm. are, are there things you think that could be effective in either state or federal policy discussions here? And, or is the risk so high that we're going to over leverage something that, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to drive negative outcomes? I mean, my, my general answer is I, I'm, my goal is to sort of expand the way that people are thinking about what institutions should be doing and can be doing. And then for everybody who knows so much about how to push the lever on incentivizing institutions to think about incentivizing them towards these types of factors, mm -hmm. using whatever levers are effective within that. You know, and I think people know what those are. And, and just adding to the menu of what institutions should be doing can help to, poo to move that a little bit. I think I better stay away from federal policy, <laughs> given my, uh, my co-author. Your co-author, yeah. Do you think that the um, different programs that we've talked about or um, interventions have different application within different types of institutions? We've talked about you know, sector-based, but also different kinds of degree programs. Are they more effective or, or important in four-year, two-year certificate programs across the board? You know, how might that differ in public versus nonprofit or, or for-profit institution context? So yes, definitely, it matters. <laughs> um, and oftentimes what tends to happen, at least in the sort of psychological factor realm, is that something is initially tested in, the type of in, in one type of institution. Mm -hmm. 
And then you start to think about, well, this only really matters for these types of students, and then expanded. And one model that I've seen has, that's been really effective is by a group called the College Transition Co Collaborative, where they work with, they come with a menu of different factors that have been shown to be really effective in certain types of institutions, and then partner with dozens of other institutions mm -hmm. along the whole spectrum of the types that you mentioned, uh, and spend time talking about the factors that matter to them, and then adapting and testing an adapted version mm. of what was initially developed, and find that that adapted version is shown to be much more effective than just the first version that was initially developed. So I think that there are ways to sort of take into account with local knowledge how these institutions differ, even across, you know, when you talk about the different types, even within those big buckets of different types, there's so much variation in who, what the populations are, um, what their prior experiences are of the students, and all that can be taken into account if we're really taking seriously the subjective experience of students. Yeah. I guess my comment on that would be that, especially for the community colleges and the regional public universities, they've suffered such dramatic budget cuts mm -hmm that um, I don't, the Cal State Fullerton example, I mean, they have, the, b before this reform, they had 10 counselors for 36,000 students. Wow. So it was really a problem, yeah. right? And so they had to actually ask the students to kick in an extra fee. They charged a 300 something dollar extra mm -hmm. fee to the students, like, hey, you need more counseling. We're not getting any funding from the, um, <clears throat> from the state for this. Are you willing to invest in this? And the students voted yes. But you know, it becomes a funding problem for these very budget-strapped uh, public universities. I would say that was the biggest distinction I, w I have seen. Oh. Nesman, you talked a little bit about um, embedding the research within the practice. And I know you <coughs> are doing research about this at a university. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know, your interaction with the university itself and how you might be able to put some of the things that you found into practice at your own school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been, I've benefited from being at a place that acknowledges that there are ways that it can grow, even though um, it's, it's generally experienced a lot of success. It wants to continue to improve and supports this type of research and supports um, actually evaluating its practices. Uh, so that has been really beneficial, but I know that it's not necessarily the norm uh, and that it can be, there can be a lot of resistance to um, shining a light on how things can bet, get better. Mm -hmm. Uh, and being open to showing those numbers of where there are real gaps and how something that you've been investing in, this program that you've been investing in, actually had no effect at all on students, right? <laughs> yeah. That you've been doing for years sometimes. Um, so, but I, uh, I think one approach that I find to be effective is to go beyond just illuminating where the problem is, but also suggesting that here's something that we can try, mm -hmm. here's something we have evidence for and how this could be adapted, mm -hmm. uh, and showing a real investment in that partnership that you know it's going to be a long-term partnership and you want to do more than just you know, show that there's a problem and walk away. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's open it up to questions. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ben Woldovsky with the College Board Policy Center. And a question for Kim. I was struck by how skeptical you are about the data analytics approaches that have gotten so much attention at places like Georgia State, uh, Purdue University, the Course Signals Program, Austin P. State University. Can you tell us a little more about, did you look at Georgia State? And oh, why yeah. is it that you think, you think they're making <laughs> claims and getting accolades that are undeserved? Uh, no, um, Georgia State, as you know, the data show, has really had a dramatic increase in its graduation rate. But if you look at when that happened, most of it happened before they instituted uh, the data-based advising, um, because it takes, it takes like four years after you institute the data-based advising to see the results. So we actually, theirs is only two or, two or three years old, so we really don't know how theirs is doing, and we won't for a couple of years. Um, uh, you know, we all, uh, not we all, but uh, there are so many examples, like the University of Akron, that spend $800,000 on this very extensive uh, data mining advising system that was a complete flop. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm a little bit uh, wary of um, especially these very high-priced uh, consultants that are sending out very mm -hmm. fancy-looking pitches to college presidents who may mm -hmm. be, you know, Ooh, this is the shiny new thing, this is what we have to do. But, you know, again, there's no plug-and-play solution. You have to be careful of cherry-picked data on, in marketing pitches. Um, in some cases, they do work, and in many cases, they do work, but I think you just... This might be sort of one of the most hyped solutions, and I think you just have to 
just be a little skeptical. Be you know, colleges should be good consumers mm -hmm. in this area. Hi, I'm Leticia Bustillos from the Campaign for College Opportunity. Um, I was hoping I can probe a little further on the recommendation you had about faculty development that encourages innovative teaching and project-based learning. In K-12, we have conversations ad nauseum about what makes for a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And evidence shows that a good teacher can make a huge difference in the lives of students. Mm -hmm. We don't have those conversations in higher ed. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about pedagogy in higher ed or the training of faculty to be good teachers. Mm -hmm. So based on your recommendation, have you found evidence of places that are actually training faculty to be good teachers? Um, <laughs> I can't say for particular institutions, uh, but the, you know, what we have sort of illuminated are there, are there are resources available. There are communities that are invested in and organizations invested in developing faculty and improving college teaching. And most great and good universities have, you know, an office of teaching, um, you know, where you can go and get resources and they try to get faculty involved and go to these um, seminars and do different fellowships. And, you know, I participated in them and they're actually great, but the incentive structure within institutions is not set up for, within many institutions, I mean, these types of research-oriented institutions are not set up to uh, reward investing in your teaching. Um, and there's not much you can do unless you change that system and actually put something in place that makes it both the norm and rewarded for faculty to invest. And you know, if people want to get tenure, um, that's going to be the priority if it's if all you're looking at is research or you're heavily, heavily, heavily weighting research and not thinking at all about, their, about uh, teaching students. Um, it's really hard to change that. I think the biggest uh, push probably is coming from students and parents uh, who are you know, becoming hip to the notion of what's happening in the classrooms, in a lot of classrooms, is not what they were expecting or not what you might um, expect to follow with this, this bill that you're receiving. Um, so I, you know, these are large, old institutions with extremely um, storied histories and how you move the needle on, on these enormous ships I think is very difficult. Um, but I think the different types of institutions do value teaching more uh, and we know what should be done and what can be done. Um, so that whole structure at the top though I think has to shift dramatically to see any sort of systematic change there. Could I, could I add to yeah. that? Please. So um, you're absolutely right and he's right of course changing the incentives at the institutional mm -hmm. level are key. Um, but there are some other efforts. I mean, in mm -hmm. California, the state legislature was tired of the terrible remediation uh, courses and basically, I think, passed a law saying no more remedial courses. You have to do something else. So there is political mm -hmm. action you can take. And the second thing I wanted to say was um, <clears throat> you might want to check out the AAU, which recently issued an incredibly strong statement saying that universities that fail to use evidence-based teaching methods are being irresponsible. Um, so. I mean, from a mealy-mouthed uh, ed education organization, that's incredibly, an incredibly strong statement. Mm. So, I mean, this is something you could take to any university and say, this is what the AAU says. Why aren't you using evidence-based teaching methods? So, I mean, you can do it from sort of a top, uh, there's a lot of top-down pressure as well as from the bottom up in terms of mm -hmm. uh, students and families. And I think I want to add as well uh, that this question is really important if you're interested at all <coughs> in sort of equity and who's actually doing well and who is likely to succeed and members of groups that are least likely to persist can benefit the most from improving what's going on in the classroom. For some students, they're going to get by no matter what the teacher is doing, but for other students, they're more likely to really thrive when you put more effort into kind of the content and the substance and how it's presented for them. My name is Sharon Dorkenbell, and I'm involved in a newly formed foundation that is looking at what we could do to support young people to set them on a path to a successful career, and we want to focus on education. So talk a little bit about completion grants, because I'm seeing they have this huge rate of success of the students graduating. 
is the fact that a student makes it to their third year really that strong an indicator that if they had the tuition that they would finish their college? Um, well, again, there's been no, like, ran I don't think there's been a randomized controlled study of completion grants, but there are two efforts. Uh, the University Innovation Alliance is working on completion grants, and I think um, Great Lakes, somebody is, mm -hmm. is working on what's called emergency grants, which is mm -hmm. the student has a flat tire, and they can come in and get the money for their tire to be fixed or something. Um, and, you know, the in initial indications are that it really does help the student because we know that they would drop out if they didn't get the grant. So we definitely know they're at least persisting that extra semester. And maybe in many cases that's all it takes is to you know, give them that little extra boost. So um, I think that there's, I think the indications are that these are working. But if you're asking me, is it guaranteed to work or you know, there isn't like really strong research on that, at least long term research. I think what's key to those resources as well is that lots of institutions do have, you know, these pots that are available for students when They're they need them, right. but they don't know how right. to find them, right. 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 and that's they don't true. know who to talk to, and it's too late once you actually find out that that's there. Well, and that not only is functionally, um, you know, not desirable, but it also, again, sends a message to the student that this isn't actually something I'm supposed to be using. It's a huge mm -hmm. problem that this has happened if it's a huge burden to actually find it. And so you, it's hard to stay motivated at that point, even if you eventually find the resource. Right. I think one of the reasons Georgia State has been so successful is that it's automatic. Nobody mm -hmm. applies for it. So what happens is they, you know, it's two days before classes start. You're a junior. You're in good standing, but you haven't registered. And then there's a bill. They just like, ah delete, right? Um, so then they call you, hey, you know, your bill's been magically paid. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a much better system because it's not, you're not asking for something, you're not, people are not having to jump through a hoop, you know, it's just automatic. I'll ask another question about the idea of targeting. So I know we, um, you talked a little <coughs> bit about the um, backlash impacts that you could have if you basically went to a student and said, I'm worried you're going to drop out. So here's the thing for you because you're likely to drop out. That's not a helpful thing mm -hmm. in terms of um, feeling like you belong or like you can succeed. So how, how do you actually target it appropriately and send the message that, um, you know, that you're going to get something that maybe not everyone else is getting, but mm -hmm you know, without having that impact of saying like, oh, it's, there's a free lunch stigma or there's yeah. a, you know, some other kind of negative impact. The, the way, the only way that I've ever seen it work to sort of target students and have them know that they're being targeted because they're particular, from a particular group is if there are individuals or offices within institutions that have real relationships with students. Mm. They actually know them. They have sustained interactions with them and they feel really comfortable with them sort of sharing openly sort of all aspects of their lives, you know. And then you, when someone's offering support and you know that they know and care about you, and you know that this office is committed to you and that you're not just being pulled in because you popped up on a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. it's not going to ignite the same level of, um, of threat of what we call identity threat. Mm. Uh, so that's the, and I think there are a number of ways that you can do that. And I think there are a number of, you know, offices and, and student affairs of uh, professionals that strive toward that. And when it's done effectively, then, you know, actually targeting the students at, at most need can happen and effectively as well. Yeah. Uh, I just, I'm sort of flashing on a, uh, another program we kind of looked at, which is the Dell Scholars Program, where they give, you know, they identify kids mm -hmm. and they give them $5,000 a year but over the years, the Dell Foundation found that just that money wasn't enough, that the kids needed so much hands-on advising. So instead of increasing the amount of aid, they, part, they patched together aid that, that kept the aid stable. But then now that somebody is calling them like every week, did you do your homework? Mm -hmm. So it's part of the package of the winning that award. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a very prestigious award. Um, but it comes with somebody holding your hand all the way through your college career. So if you make it part of a holistic embrace of the student, like, wow, you're great, you know, you got into this college, you won this wonderful scholarship, and it comes with this nifty, uh, you know, annoying, you know, person who's going <laughs> to call you every week, you know. And I, I, somebody over there had a question, I see. Yeah. I think they call that intrusive advising, right, right, which right, I right, always right, thought right. should have a better name. Right. Yeah. My name is Leonard Campbell. Um, my question is for Kim, uh, surrounding this notion of schools having pots of money available for emergencies or people who've run out of funding. What, what is the argument against just cutting the tuition if you know that the, 
the tuition given uh, you know, the high rate of tuition inflation over the years and so on and so forth. If you know that's an impediment to completion, what's the argument against just lowering the tuition? Right, right, of course. Well, many states are doing this now with free college programs and at the elite schools, basically, if you're low income, you get a free ride, right? I mean, so obviously price matters. Um, there's also been research showing that if you cut revenue, if you cut tuition, then you have, often that means cuts in quality because they have less uh, funding. And really, cut, just cutting price is not enough if you're going to cut the quality because then people are going to drop out. So if it means less revenue, they have to figure out, they have to get revenue somehow, right? Mm. Yeah, but that's only for certain. They're getting they're getting that those extra. So so they're discriminating on price. They're getting lots of revenue from the other kids who are paying the bills. And if they cut the price to zero for everybody, then they would get no revenue. Mm. Then that's what the endowment, the office of endowment. That's what the endowment offices for are yeah. for, and everything else, so that you can raise the money. And say, hey, we we've identified this need. We'd like people to donate so that we can have this pot. But overall rather than having all of the students subsidize other students who maybe they're not, not, not in a position to do that anyway. Mm. Uh, I mean, why not just do that instead? Well, it's not so easy to raise endowment funds. But I mean, I think w one issue that you've, you've identified is, is you know, the, the, the nature of the funding model and, and built on this idea that you will raise the price as far as it will go where there are still people that, will, that are right. available to pay it. Mm -hmm. And that's, the higher that it gets, the more lower income people that it can subsidize out to admission for. It's not, in many ways, not an ideal model, but I think in some institutions, that's the rationale behind it. And there are certainly consequences to that. Um, I think one of the ways to mitigate those consequences is to really re, and we do a lot of work in this area, which is to really rethink the messaging around those costs. Um, many students don't even know at young ages what financial aid is and how it works and that it's available. Um, you know, these sticker prices can exist, but they don't need to be the first and only thing you see associated with the university because it sets you up as early as early adolescents to think there's no way that I could ever pay for that, even though there's no way you would have to if you get into a certain type of institution. So I don't think the messaging needs to be the way that it is right now, even if it's really difficult to think about ways to radically change that type of funding model. But also just to get to your point, I mean, what you're arguing for, it sounds like, is more public tax support for colleges so that they don't have to charge tuition, which actually was the way it was 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, University of California was, you know, $500 or something, and now it's $13,000. So it used to be that way. All right, so we're going to wrap up here, and we are going to come back at 3.35 to have a conversation about policy and how to implement all of this, because that's what we do in Washington, D.C. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay. We're uh, going to tee up for our third and final panel, uh, which is going to help make help us make sense of what's been presented so far and translate this into a policy context. Uh, this third panel is going to be chaired by Bethany Little, a principal at Education Council, LLC, uh, a longtime friend and colleague who has been, as always, an enormous help uh, for us in Third Way as we've done this work. Somebody else who's been an enormous help, I just want to say a quick word of thanks, is Cody Christensen for the terrific job he's done um, with all of this. Cody, thank you much. Uh, Bethany has spent 20 years working in government and nonprofits, including the U.S. Department of Education and the White House. Uh, in the U.S. Senate, she served as Chief Education Counsel to the HELP Committee under two chairs, uh, Senators Kennedy and Harkin, as well as as a legislative aide to Patty, Senator Patty Murray. Um, Bethany, please take us away. Excellent. Make my way up here and invite the panelists to come up and join me as we do some quick introductions and get into the conversation. I'd hoped I'd sit in the middle so that I could say on my right and on my left, but no. <laughs> it got me over here. But nonetheless, we have a right and a left. Um, in order in my, my notebook, I have James Bergeron who's president of the National Council like a, of Higher Education like Resources. <laughs> Come on up, James. Um, and was formerly the director of Education and Human Services Policy at the House Committee on Education and the Workforce, uh, working on the Republican side. I'm going to be oh, clear sorry. about our <laughs> politics. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, and uh, after James, in my notes, I have Denise Fork, who is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. It's not good. And we're just going to do all the things. <laughs> <laughs> to make ourselves comfortable up here. Um, and before going to the Century Foundation, she was the staff director for the House Committee on Education and the Workforce um, and Education Policy Director for George Miller before that, um, so in the Democratic side. Uh, back to our Republican side, we're pleased to be joined by Amy Jones, the Director of Education and Human Services Policy at the Committee on Education and the Workforce in the U.S. House of Representatives right now, so we appreciate her making the time to come join us. And also currently serving as a leader in Congress, we have Kara Marchione, who's the Education Policy Director at the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. So really excited to have this group up here to dive into a few questions about policy and what some of the implications are of the conversation we've been having already today. Um, it's been very interesting to watch the evolution of the conversation today. We started with a bit of discussion about the issue of um, students who've been less advantaged and what it might take for their success in college, um, recognizing it's probably going to take more resources at the college end of that. Um, and then we heard a lot of evidence um, that what colleges do, I'm going to use colleges shorthand for IHE, institutions of higher education, what they are doing, uh, the choices they're making um, can have an enormous impact on completion. And we saw that through the programs that um, Kim studied and, and wrote about and the ones that Mesmin did as well. Um, so ranging from um, smaller daily decisions about how students experience their campus and their interaction with faculty to larger decisions around what kind of a program will we put into place at the beginning of the year, uh, the choices of institutions of higher education have impact on the completion rate. And so the question I would start off with is, um, can federal policy, at a price tag of about $130 billion worth of student aid a year, afford to ignore the choices that colleges may or may not make in terms of elevating completion? Is this something that federal policy really needs to do something about, address, uh, bring into the to the policy realm. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to any of you um, who want to speak to that. I'm, I'm happy to go first. First, thank you, Bethany. Thanks, AEI and Third Wave for inviting me here today. Uh, I will say um, I've spent the same 20 plus years in the, in the biz as Bethany has, uh, spending time both in the House and in the administration. Um, you know, I think a lot of administrations, honestly, have tried to tackle the completion question because they knew of this massive investment that we had going on in higher ed and wanting to make sure that taxpayers themselves were getting and consumers were getting the best bang for their buck. But one of the challenges, um, ultimately, uh, whether it's data, whether it's the fact that we're not learning that much has been scalable on the completion side, um, is having the ultimate will to figure out whether this is something that we need to do. Um, and then another point I'll just add is, 
you know, if we sort of step back and understand or think about what we want higher education to result in and what the important outcomes are, uh, better learning, better wages, better jobs. Um, but I think the one thing that we haven't been talking about that much is how important it is to have critical thinkers in our democracy and what that means. And so when you think about completion and its role in higher education, uh, I think the federal government, at least from my perspective, has thought about it for a long while, but hasn't quite figured out what necessarily that it is, although they know what the outcome is that they want. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I do agree. I mean, I think to answer your question, Bethany, I, don't, I do not believe that institutions uh, you know, can't afford to ignore the college completion debate that's kind of going on in this country. And I'm not, I agree with Denise. I, I don't think that they have to a certain degree. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, folks are definitely aware about the importance of graduation. Um, folks obviously are aware of the fact that um, the best way for folks to repay federal student loans, um, which is a big issue kind of sweeping across this country, is to actually graduate um, and to actually get a good job and to be able to pay back your, 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 uh, the investment that the taxpayers have made on your behalf. Um, I, I think on the federal level, some of these things have kind of creeped in mainly around cost. So, for example, when folks are kind of looking at controlling the price of Pell, for example, that's when you look at maybe they impose some of the limitations on how, on how many semesters students can go can, can deal with whenever they had the 150 percent, um, you know, limitation on receiving a subsidized loan. That was kind of done within a cost factor that just had indirect consequences on kind of the college completion debate. Um, cohort default rates, obviously, is something, uh, and this issue around institutional quality, uh, obviously has kind of college completion uh, factors. But I do think what's so exciting about kind of the discussion that happened today was this need to look at it from a holistic point of view and the fact that there isn't a single kind of uh, issue or, or a single identifiable solution to kind of the challenges that we have. It's really going to be something that states, institutions, um, as well as the federal government you know, deals with. So I, I know we'll get into some of these things about um, you know, what is the role of the federal government, what's the role of states, what are institutions, um, what are parents and students um, uh, looking at? But I, I think that you know, there's definitely an awareness. Um, but I agree with Janice. No one's kind of have figured out how to deal with this from, from the federal government and looking at it from a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, I think dealing with it at the federal level is really difficult because federal policy, as we've all talked about, you know, is kind of a one-size-fits-all approach, and it's hard to do that in a sector with a, with a higher ed um, system that is so diverse and, and has so many different um, kind of needs as you look at different communities and different types of institutions and all of that. So looking at, and we have, we have obviously some levers at the federal government to help incentivize, um, provide an incentive for behavior, but at the same time, there's the, 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 the federal string is, is very tangential there. So um, when you're looking at the way that federal student aid flows, it flows to the student, and so that's where the federal role is. It's, it's to help students gain access to um, education. Now, you're hearing much more at the federal level about completion, but the one thing that if anyone has heard me speak before, talking as a cautionary tale, is this, this desire that the federal government sometimes has to set you know, sets of benchmarks, kind of like what we've done, what we did in um, No Child Left Behind. And because we're spending a lot of money, we must have, we have to do something. We need more bang for our buck. Um, and so you're going to end up with kind of a No Child Left Behind for higher ed, which, is, which I don't think anyone wants. Um, and so it's, it's having this conversation and having this dialogue and trying to think through the levers that we do have at the federal government to try to push institutions while at the same time recognizing that and being comfortable recognizing that the federal government may not be all of the answers. And to James's point, and um, I think, Denise, some of what you were saying, I think institutions are trying to do the right thing in many cases, and you, you've seen some really innovative um, institutions, traditional institutions, you've seen a lot of higher ed disruption, um, more so in the, in the past several years than you've seen in kind of decades with, with higher ed, um, kind of driving at that idea that we're trying to get students in and through in the most kind of cost-effective way. So I think that all plays together, and I think that's kind of hard to do in just one sweeping um, place. Just, um, you know, I agree with a lot of things that the panelists have set up here, and I, I think, um, yes, we certainly do need to continue thinking about completion as one of the policy levers as we're moving forward um, with HEA. 
Uh, but I also agree that we are not looking at a one-size-fits-all model. So there is an ability to be nuanced and careful in our considerations and our discussions and make sure that we are focusing on the student, but also looking at accountability for institutions. So it's not going to be easy for sure, but I do think that we're at a point in time where we have to start having these honest conversations about why completion is important and about why we need to be thinking about the bang for the buck in higher education. Um, so it, it can be done, and it can be done in a nuanced way. I'm curious, um, we have some folks who've been in and around this work a long time. Rick kindly dated me to more than 20 years in it. I started when I was six. Um, but um, I, I'm, I'm curious, have we seen the completion issue really debated as a point of focus in HEA reauthorizations in the past? Um, you know, to what degree has completion and the issue of how much are we spending versus how much are we getting um, been a part of the debate and the legislative process um, through the HEAs that folks have worked on before? Not much. I mean, you know, I've been on the Hill, I was on the Hill about 17 years, so not quite the 20. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, you know, and Amy kind of knows this because I relied on her a lot when she was on the committee. Uh, she knows more about higher education policy than, than most on, uh, on, on, on both sides. Um, but, you know, there used to be a situation where, you know, origination fees and interest rates kind of dominated uh, the discussion. And as many folks in this room know, when you go and you'll bring a bill to the House floor, the Senate floor, you kind of start putting together a one or two page document that you can start talking, uh, you know, to members about what's in your bill. Um, and I remember, you know, many times it was about, you know, we held the interest rate or, you know, we held origination, we lower, lowered origination fees or we kind of put a sense of Congress in there on that. I mean, we were talking about issues that at this point seem somewhat nebulous. But back then, they were by far the most important um, issues out there. So I do think you've got this sea change that's coming, and you know, Congress at some point is going to feel the pressure, uh, and maybe they are right now, to kind of figuring out you know, how, uh, you know, what, what, what role do they play um, in kind of the completion debate. But it's only been recently, and, and um, you know, I, it, it's, it hasn't been part of kind of you know, starting from scratch about what you're trying to, what are you trying to accomplish, and then how do you build kind of policies that support that. Usually it's mainly around access. It has been around access, and you know, we really, um, you know, even now, you know, folks are like, we got to talk about access and completion. It can't be, you know, one or the other. Um, and so, you know, I think access still is a pretty, uh, still gets a lot of the the newsprint, and it should. Um, but I, I do think you've got a bigger part of com you know, on the completion side. Anyone want to add anything that? to that historical? Yeah, I would just say it's always, it's taken us a long time throughout the education lifespan to think about outputs and um, how we're going to be looking at student achievement. Um, so it took us a while on K-12, it's taken us a while now on, on higher ed to start having those conversations. So I think it's an evolution, as James said, and looking at, you know, we were focused on access, but now as you continue to have those conversations, what else do you need to be looking at? Yeah. I was just going to say, I think for the first time now, we're thinking more about student experience. Uh, and I don't recall that in past reauthorizations that we're actually thinking about what goes on, what is that experience that that student has to keep them in the pipeline, to keep them going, what are the supports that they need. Yeah. Um, and uh, both Kara and James are right, access has been the traditional way. Then we had a time when we were also looking at cost and affordability, but and I don't think that the rich conversations that we're having now around completion, while also in our, their nascent stage, you know, um, uh, we did not have those in the past where you talked about student experience. Yeah, it well, And the change in the student population, too, I think. Right, is, mm -hmm. I mean, that's right. to that point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yep. You have a very different population going now to school than you did, you know, in, in any of the previous reauthorizations. Um, or any times we've been moving the bill, you're talking about a very unique population. You're talking about you know a, a significant skills gap that everyone is hearing about on both sides of the aisle. You're, you've got huge total kind of cumulative student debt numbers that are popular to talk about those types of things. So um, all, I think all of those things factored in together have kind of led to this conversation. And, and all of us know that sort of the issues that get dealt with are the issues that are ripe, 
things that are, for a variety of reasons, whether it's the economic pressures or something else that's happening in society that's drawing attention to student experience on campus, things become ripe. And you pointed out, James, that um, you know may, people have to feel the pressure. And I'm curious, do, do we get a sense that this is an issue that's ripe and that there's pressure? And I'm also curious specifically about that pressure from a partisan lens. I'm, I'm interested, do we feel like Republicans feel pressure on this for some reason or Democrats feel pressure on this for some reason? Is it pressure to act or pressure not to act? Um, I love thoughts on any of that? I mean, I'd argue, since we're in the process of moving a bill, um, <laughs> that, we, that we certainly feel pressure. Um, you know, you talk to any of the members in our conference, um, and frankly, we heard this from some of our Democrats on the House side, too, when, when we were doing the CTE bill, um, in terms of employers coming in, all different sectors, all different industries coming in, saying that they have these unfilled jobs, and that they're looking for people to fill those jobs at all levels. Um, these aren't just you know, certificate level jobs, kind of all up and down the, uh, um, the spectrum. And so between that and the, the debt numbers that we're seeing, um, I think there is a lot of pressure. And I think folks are feeling that um, to, while there are definitely some um, good examples in the higher ed sector, I think we're still educating people the same way we did back in you know, 1910. And, and you have different students going in with different needs, and why, aren't, why, isn't, why hasn't more of higher ed kind of updated because of that? And so I think all of those things combined are definitely um, leading our, our members to feel pressure to, to move forward and kind of shake up the system. So I'm curious, um, without sort of maligning the, the colleges who we know are doing a lot of different things, it, it is clear, and, and speaking not all the motivations, but it is clear that they're leaving a lot on the table. Right, so we heard today you've got institutions that are investing year after year in bridge programs with no idea with, of whether or not they work, even though they might be in a research institution. And um, a 20-minute in intervention that could reduce a persistence gap by 60%. Um, these seem like really quite a bit left on the table by institutions in terms of actions that they could be taking um, towards driving uh, better completion. We also all know that the incentives that are put on the table are real. Um, people do respond to policy directions and incentives, sometimes over-respond, and I know we always have to be cautious about that. I'm curious if, if we, there's a concern um, or a thought about um, what kind of incentive do we need to create? What needs to be different to encourage institutions not to be so blasé about the completion issue, uh, not to leave all of this on the table, um, when at the moment, from the federal me direction, the message is the money's there for you no matter what. Student completes, student doesn't complete. Doesn't change how much you get for Pell and student loans. Um, so w how does that play out uh, when you think about policy opportunities? Well, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, both Amy and I kind of commented the fact that, you know, institutions are aware that this is a challenge and there's a number of states and institutions that um, are trying to address this issue. But there's no doubt that federal policymakers are concerned uh, about this from an institutional quality issue. I mean, you know, how many risk sharing bills do we have out there, you know, right now in the House and Senate, more so in the Senate? Um, so folks obviously, you know, believe that there needs to be or that institutions are not doing enough. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's the question for kind of the House and Senate is to determine what should they be doing, what is enough, what are those benchmarks, um, and, you know, how does that kind of factor into, uh, you know, the, the accountability metric, um, you know, that's out there. I, I think, um, you know, it's, it, I think from my perspective, what I, 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 I like about this particular discussion point is that for the longest time we've been focusing primarily on, on cohort default rates and kind of uh, you know gainful employment and others as the accountability metric, and in my sense, the kind of the cake is baked by then. Um, and you know, really, right now we're kind of talking about the ingredients. You know, we're talking about whether or not the student has picked the right school that will be good for them. Um, we're talking about whether or not they're actually going to graduate. Um, we're actually talking about you know where they can get a good paying job not kind of looking after the fact when they've already chosen the, 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 the degree field, they've already chosen the college, they've already, they're, they're pretty much locked. And then we wonder why a kid can't pay back their loans when they've taken this astronomical, um, in some cases astronomical, most of the, def most of the defaults are for somewhat you know, middle, middle kind of uh, level um, student loans. So I do think that this is a real healthy debate to kind of look at things from the front end um, but this is a very precarious situation that federal policymakers are going to have to do because you're going to have to control 
for some of these variables that are really difficult to do so, especially as Matt pointed out with the SES kind of factors uh, that impact. So real important debates that we're having. We never had these before when I was up there. Um, and I'm kind of happy that we, I mean, off the record, <laughs> happy that we didn't. Because these are really one, these are really hard, uh, I think they're really hard questions to answer, but there's no doubt that they're important. I think that's symbol, symbolic of some of the bills that we've seen coming out of Congress in both parties. Yeah. I think the other, oh, sorry, I was just going to say the other challenge for those guys, and not me anymore, <laughs> is, uh, you know, the fact that um, there is such variability in the student population, the institutions, what the state role is, and I, you know, it, it, I sometimes think that it is hard for policymakers to um, uh, sort of appreciate the variability without wanting to step on it and make it uniform, right? And I don't think under the completion work that we're actually going to find a uniform one size fits all. And Kara said that earlier. So, I mean, that's, that's the challenge that these two have. <laughs> and I think the approach can't be just looking at only through the lens of kind of the the student aid stuff. You can't let accreditors mm -hmm. off the hook because for a number of years you had institutions that were trying to do creative things and the accreditors were, you know, scared of their own shadow because one could argue that the administration was coming down on them for trying to trying to approve different things. Um, and so they weren't approving things. So I don't want to put all the blame on institutions because I think accreditation has had a, a part of this to part of the blame as well. Um, but you know, in, in looking at some of the things that we've that we've talked about, whether it be skin in the game, as James um, pointed out, and as we've had folks come up and testify about, as um, looking at kind of loan repayment rates and switching from kind of the institutional cohort default rate to trying to get kind of a programmatic loan re, uh, loan repayment rate out there, or get more information out there um, about what ha what is happening at the programmatic level. I think as you're having more and more contemporary students go back to school, that is becoming more and more important because those students aren't necessarily looking at the whole institution because they're looking for a very different experience than what um, other students might be looking for. They're looking at the program and how what are people doing in the program. Um, and then also looking at our um, our college access programs and trying to kind of whether it be the TRIO and the, or the Gear Up programs, making sure that they're delivering on the promise that they've um, given to the students that are going into those programs um, and ensuring that the, whatever techniques they're using are, are actually working and are, and are successful. So I think all of those things have to be able to work together in order to have, have success. Um, so. Yeah, and I, I would agree with a lot of what um, my colleagues up here have said, and I think I would just add that, um, you know, we are seeing some institutions who are stepping up and really um, doing good things for students. And it's so, from our perspective at the federal policy side, it's not necessary to replicate that, but it's to see what they're doing and figure out how to support them um, in, in improving education for our students. So. I think you know we do have to be looking at the triad. We can't be looking at one size fits all. Um, we have to be nuanced in this conversation, and we have a lot of lessons to learn. The other thing I guess I'll just quickly add too that um, is not discounting the kind of the bully pulpit. I mean, we did a whole series of hearings early on um, on positive things that states were doing, positive things that institutions were doing um, to help further the. the whether it was completion or access or affordability, um, those conversations. Um, and frankly, this was something that I thought the Obama administration did pretty well, was kind of use the bully pulpit to, to convene groups and things like that and, and bring folks together to have a dialogue. Um, so I don't want to discount that. It doesn't always have to be a legislative solution. Mm -hmm. Some of it's just getting the information out there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, without a doubt, the focus on something from the federal level causes focus to cascade, yeah. and that makes sense. You mentioned accreditation, Amy, which is a really good point. We've seen schools that have gone out of business and schools with incredibly single digit, uh, incredibly low single digit graduation rates that remain accredited. Um, what is the role of the issue of completion for accreditors, or what should it be? To what degree do accreditors? Um, have a responsibility to focus on whether or not students at an institution are getting degrees? I mean, I think that is their charge, right? Accreditors are supposed to be looking at kind of the quality of the institution, and that is what what we have said that you know their role is. Unfortunately, I think over time, they have become kind of compliance checks um, for the federal government. And so it's, you know, 
I don't want to say the books in the library because that's the excuse everyone used, and I don't know that they actually do that anymore. But, um, uh, but that's kind of the, the thought that's out there, and they're so compliance-driven, and they're just not spending as much time as or much time as we would like. Um, and some of them are. I don't, don't want to say there's actually been a lot of change in the accreditation space, even um, kind of led in many cases by the Western Association. Um, but really getting them to focus on outcomes and focus on... Um, what that looks like and to, again, not be afraid to move forward. But uh, again, some of the challenge there that they've faced either um, on more, some of the more innovative, innovative um, pathways that they've tried to look at, um, they've been very fearful to kind of approve those. But then also, you know, if they try to go after an institution because it's something that they don't see, they know that there's political pressure and lawsuits coming. And so is there something that, you know, we can do to, to help mitigate some of that and you know I think that's kind of an ongoing conversation yeah anyone else have accreditation thoughts on what that role might be I think Amy you did a, did a good job on that um, I'm interested in, in understanding you know you as you mentioned you're moving a bill sorry mm -hmm. to go back to Amy but you're moving a bill what, what did you see that you put on the table in prosper um, to get at this issue of completion Sure. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, I mean, we definitely looked at some um, a skin in the game proposal um, that looked at return to Title IV, um, looking at the return to Title IV process and trying to hold institutions on the hook for, um, for more funds if the student withdraws. That was one idea um, that we looked at. Trying to look at the programmatic um, at programmatic information and loan repayment rates at the programmatic level. Um, so trying to hold programs accountable to see if they're meeting kind of the needs of the community and market needs. Um, that was another one, and, and providing better information at, uh, providing better, just better information at the programmatic level about um, debt levels and um, earnings information too at the, so when students are trying to pick their program, they have um, a better sense as to what students in the program are actually doing. Um, we also focused on, in accreditation, we focused on, um, trying to get them to really hone in on student outcomes um, and get them away from kind of all of the compliance activities so that they could really focus on the outcomes th on the outcomes pieces. I know there are other pieces that just aren't coming to mind right now too, but um, those were kind of some of the, the ones that at the top of my head. But this was definitely, you know, part of our dialogue and conversations. And what do you think still left on the table? Either other folks who up here who have other policy ideas that you think could have pushed towards completion, or things you you considered, Amy, that would have pushed towards completion that you can't or, or didn't do. Um, what else could be put on the table for federal policy that could address this issue of completion? I guess I would say anything that we that came to us that we thought was good, we put in. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there were other things that were kind of left on the. the cutting room floor. I, I don't know that any come to mind immediately. And I'm curious what the group thinks, like, who benefits from a lack of focus on completion? Who, who's going to argue about policies that are focused on completion? Because we haven't gotten to completion as one part of the story of why we haven't done uh, policy on completion from the federal level, but there's always some back and forth and some pushback on things. And, and where do we see that potentially playing out here? I mean, the, like the pitfalls, kind of in the, the debate. That I, we I think the pitfalls, but also who's gonna, who might stand up and say, no, let, this is not actually where we yeah. need to go. It needs to be about access and, uh, only, and why? Who benefits from that lack of? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one of the panelists kind of said earlier today that you know one of the things we have in this country is that we need to have an understanding that for some kids, college does not put them in a better financial situation than, than they have gone in. I mean, and, and that's not really a debate that we as a country have had. I mean, as a parent, I don't want to hear that. Uh, you know, I don't want to hear that, you know, enrolling my son in a college, he may come out worse. He may come out with, you know, $100,000 in student loans. So I, I think one of the challenges that folks will have to determine is, you know, what is that dividing line between access and burden? Um, and, you know, I think that's probably some of the pitfalls that, that, that uh, you know, folks are kind of looking at is, you know, what, you know, what impact would it have on selectivity of, you know, you know college enrollment? Um, you know, what, what, that's a huge issue, I think, for, um, you know, a lot of folks. What impact will that have just on kind of the overall fundamental reason of why we have college? 
um, which is to a certain degree, yes, to get a job, but at the same time to kind of you know, better yourself um, overall. So I think part of it is um, maybe more psychological and more kind of just bigger picture. Um, but I think you have that data. Uh, you know, obviously, is a is a huge challenge. Um, you know, with being able to have an accurate you know graduation rate or kind of accurate information that you want to provide to students, I can see definitely you know that being a challenge. Cost. Um, I think you know a lot of the fact you know folks have talked about the fact that um, you know student supports you know which would I think has been most successful in some of the at the institution level or, or those. Um, programs where um, you know low-income uh, students are provided intensive services, personalized services um, as well. So I think that that's some challenges as well. So I, I think there's a number of reasons you know why the federal government hasn't, um, I think, been more um, uh, you know supportive, I suppose, of some of these efforts. And that's something that I think you guys are probably dealing with um, you know now. Or you will be next year. But I do think, um, to your point, James, I think um, you've, if you watch kind of the, the language that's coming out of our committee, um, and I, th I think it's on both sides, recognizing that we're talking about kind of a post-secondary credential and not just a college degree anymore. So it's not necessarily about first out of the gate getting a, a baccalaureate degree. Um, it's trying to think about making sure that post, some form of post-secondary education is accessible for everybody. And in, in an ideal world, um, you're earning, you're going down kind of a stackable credentials route. And that was one of the other, one of the two other things that I thought about in the PROSPER Act. One is allowing kind of these shorter term programs to partner with universities and, be, and have access to student aid. Um, and then the, is trying to kind of incentivize um, completion. And then our $300 um, Pell Grant bonus for um, folks that are taking 15, uh, 15 credits a semester so you're actually um, graduating um, kind of on time within your program because the research shows that you, you do better with that. So, or if you go full time, you do better and you're more likely to complete. Um, but getting at this, the stackable credential idea so that if you're a non-traditional student and if you're, or if you're a traditional student, even as you're progressing through, you're earning certificates or an associates. And so then if life gets in the way and you have to drop out for whatever reason, you have pieces of paper that you can go and, and potentially get a better job than what you would have otherwise gotten. And, and the debt that you took out to get there actually means something. So that's something that uh, I think would be a... Again, some schools are kind of experimenting with. Um, you're seeing a lot of um, partnerships open up between two-year schools and baccalaureate schools in terms of, um, particularly at the, at the public level, um, in terms of transfer of credit agreements and those types of things. But um, it's that stackable idea that I think would be really, really helpful to the current college-going population. Because it's not about getting that certificate and then stopping. It's really lifelong learning and making sure that, that higher ed is accommodating for people that want to go and, but have to stop out for whatever reason and then can go back in and they feel welcome to come back in and they feel encouraged to kind of continue on with their learning. Yeah, the innovation of stackable credentials does seem like a, a move forward, but um, the person who was speaking on the panel earlier that you referenced, James, was saying the students who are the worst off are the people who get some college and um, no degree and then they have debt. So it's that combination that really leaves folks mm -hmm. the worst off. And I get, I think a lot of people go at that um, situation with the assumption that you used, Amy, that life gets in the way, but really we look across institutions of higher education and actually they get in the way. Often you have institutions of higher education with very similar populations and they are not graduating students and they're largely not graduating um, students who are at a disadvantage, who've put at a disadvantage. And so I think, <clears throat> I wonder, uh, can, can we just, uh, ignore sort of that we've given this free flow of money to institutions and said have at the students and whether or not your students repeatedly on a pattern fail over and over again we're just going to keep that money flowing is there a line below which um, we shouldn't be willing to go um, with giving away federal dollars yeah, I, I certainly think that we need to hold institutions accountable hold their feet to the fire I think the, the question really comes you know and working in education policy for a very long time mainly in K-12, but now in the higher ed space, and looking at the different accountability systems and what we're doing on student outcomes, we have to make sure that we're not swinging the pendulum too far um, as well. And so what that means to me is being very thoughtful. So looking at different institutions, missions, and goals, and the students that they're serving, the supports that student needs. Um, so I think the answer is 100% that we have to be looking at 
um, where the tipping point is, but there are so many factors that go into that conversation that we have to be really thoughtful about. You raise a lot of issues that it's hard to unpack. Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons I just kind of repeat what I said earlier, which is I, I do think this is something that um, the public pressure. I think we're at a point of the public pressure where you know this is a healthy debate to have, and you're having a lot of states have that with performance funding kind of you know aspects of it. I think really for a lot of families, this is this is not only a student issue. I mean, this is a family issue, especially with the growth of plus loans. Uh, and so you know you definitely see a situation where families are kind of you know seeing impact. Um, of kind of the, you know, folks that aren't re really receiving that particular degree. And we know that's obviously, you know, has a huge impact on retirement and all, and all these other efforts. Um, another thing you kind of talked about was, I really do think we need to have a conversation about dropout recovery. Uh, we talk about that a lot, you know, on the K through 12 level. And we're, right now we're talking about, you know, graduation and how to help those students that um, ensure that their students are graduating. But we've got a lot of kids that have dropped out. They've got a lot of debt. And really, I don't know. I don't know what we how we expect those kids to pay for that. You know how they, we expect those kids to pay for that um, their loans back. So I know that there are some states that are kind of working on uh, you know pilot programs to go in and, and provide dropout recovery um, assistance. And maybe part of that is you know making sure they're enrolling in the right program so they can have access or eligibility to federal aid. Um, but I, I do think we have to have these conversations because um, you know we do have uh, you know a significant number of you know, students who, you know, right now, you know, are really, they're kind of lost about, you know, how they move forward. So let's not forget about kind of the graduate. I realize, or like the non-graduate, the non-completer, because I do think they're important. And maybe this is a conversation that more states need to, need, need to have, not necessarily at the federal level. But, you know, when, and I agree with what everyone said, I think the sort of going back to your earlier question of what uh, could be done to incentivize some of the work that's going on now um, is because we are hearing there are so many pilot projects. There are, we haven't been able to take a lot of things to scale. Institutions are doing one thing, states are doing another. Um, I think the community and the overall uh, uh, sort of the stakeholders involved in this, the families, students, institutions, and states would benefit from some sort of innovation fund. I know we talked about that before, but it, you know, in a way, those uh, opportunities, whether it was I3, or we've had a number of them out there, um, they raise to some level um, some new thinking that people can then invest on to see if the practice is really working. Um, I'm excited about some of the things that like Georgia State has done and ASAP, and then we have you know some of the work that the I3 program yielded with TRIO in Kentucky. But more needs to be done like that. So I think, you know, yes, the conversation is good. But uh, at the same time, unless we have more practices on the ground that are yielding some proof points, we're not going to give, you know, our friends in Congress anything to work from so that they have models to go after to actually work. Do you think, though, that it's Congress's um a best role ever to sort of try to scale up a model. I think, you know, you can think about the I3 type of grants where you give larger dollars to the things that are most likely to work. That makes sense mm -hmm. to me. But uh, I think what we heard um, from Mesman and others is there are actually a ton of things that people could be doing. The question is, um, what's the incentive to scale? Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. what makes me do anything differently? At this point, if I'm an institution, that, that Pell Grant, that loan money is coming one way or the other, whether I've done anything to change my practices, whether more students are graduating or not. So is the right federal role to sort of try to identify the right programs that need to be put in place, or is the right federal role to be doing something more on, on the incentive side of completion? I am always leery of models, um, and just, again, that one-size-fits-all kind of um, uh, belief, and I think we learned a lot from the K-12 world. Um, that we can translate into the higher ed world on not just accepting and placing models. Um, but there is definitely a role on incentivizing completion. And I think, again, it's just figuring out exactly how to do that. But I don't think it would ever work just to um, pick and plop or whatever they um, talk about on, on models. I just think there's too much diversity, um, both in institutions, in students, um, and in the degrees or credentials. Yeah. I mean, there used to be a program, you know, FIPSI, right? I mean, right. Fund, they fund for the improvement of post-secondary education, mm -hmm. which became an earmark 
uh, mm-hmm. aspect of it, and uh, you know, then it became it was eliminated once Congress right. eliminated their marks. Uh, so I mean, there is some I, I history think historic around history mm-hmm. around kind of creating an institutional based program that's focused on innovation. There's also a lot of private money out there. To uh, right. Denise, you were starting to I think a little mm-hmm. bit down this path, um, and. I, I argue, and my friends that work at some of these organizations know this, um, that we don't necessarily hear about, hear back on, yeah. on what those private dollars are doing. So mm-hmm. you have these, all of these things that sound really great out there, but then if it either fails or goes really, really well, you don't really hear either way, and so you don't necessarily know. Um, in addition, I do wonder if now is kind of the, the time that we're going to be hearing back, or if we still need, if some of those models or some of those... Um, funded projects are still kind of out in the field and the evidence just isn't in yet. I mean, that's the other issue is that it has, we have not been talking about this um, for very long. And so you do need a little bit of time, unfortunately, for, for some of this to play out to see if it's going to work or not. And so I don't want, I wouldn't want Congress to kind of rush to judgment um, to, to implement something that, you know, is, is kind of half-baked or like the early results are positive. You want, you want to see that... Um, it's kind of more thoroughly done. Mm-hmm. And even even if there is sort of a scaling, it's less of a, you know, Congress can mandate that folks mm-hmm. do something. It can't mandate that they do it well. Makes and so um, it's often uh, risky to mm-hmm. suggest that Congress should sort of say, go do this one thing. But the incentive side seems important. I, I like the fact that um, folks have talked a lot here up here about capacity, about the issue of if we're going to have an incentive, if we're going to have a focus on completion, we have to expect that there's going to be some capacity building and support as well to in- elevate that completion level. And I think um, for many of us, that was a lesson learned from the No Child Left Behind Act and the federal K-12 accountability is that if you sort of say the expectation is you're going to do better and there isn't a recognition that that may take actual change in practice and actual capacity to do things differently, you may end up sort of worse off. I'm curious, as you have this debate and these discussions, are there other pieces from K-12 education that um, come to mind as relevant as we think about what a design um, that focuses on completion might be for the higher education space? Are there other um, either exciting areas of, you know, we've learned multiple measures matter or other cautionary tale parts of it? I mean, I'll, I'll, it's not like a specific um, example, but just as, a, as something that for anyone that has followed kind of education policy, whether it be K-12 or higher ed knows, it takes Congress a, a long time to act on something. And so one of the things um, that we have to be cognizant of is what higher ed looks like now versus mm-hmm. what higher ed will look like by the time the next reauthorization comes around mm-hmm. is very, very different. And you saw that, I use all the time, the definition of distance ed, we thought that was like the bee's knees when we put it in in 2005. And you look at it now and it's literally laughable. It talks about VHS and beta and, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's seriously kind of disturbing. Um, but, and, but, you're try- but you're trying to make the act um, kind of flexible enough so that the institutions and states and, and other partners um, can be out there and, and try things and, and move the conversation forward and don't have to wait for us. And so that is that is one of the challenges is we're talking about like the federal incentives and things like that, that I think if we start, if we start throwing in a bunch of things that work now, that may not work in literally just like five years. Um, and so, I mean, there were, there were whole parts of the, of the 2008 re that were done and were like completely out of date by the time that we actually passed the bill just because it had been through so many processes. Um, um, and so we, I think we do have to be a little bit thoughtful about that and just looking at kind of how the, how the um, world shifted in the K-12 space between um, No Child Left Behind and ESSA, I just, these, these laws take a while in many cases to get updated. Um, and so I would hate to put kind of a strict framework in that is going to be outdated you know, by the time it actually gets signed into law. One of the things I would say that I'm hopeful we'll get a focus on um, that is kind of a lesson learned in K-12 was the focus on subgroups and special populations and achievement gaps. And I think, um, I personally don't think we talk enough about that at the higher education level, and I think that's something I hope more conversation will be focused around. I think that's very important. Um, and I think cautionary tales are just around what I had kind of mentioned before, where you know a lot of people feel that NCLB swung the pendulum too far on the accountability side, 
And now a lot of people think ESSA swung the pendulum too far back the other way. And so what we're trying to do is be thoughtful and hit a sweet spot. Congress rarely hits that. Um, so I think now is the time to be having this conversation. And, and papers like the ones that were put out um, are very helpful for us in developing these thoughts. But we are very cognizant of these things as we move into next reauthorization. So I'm going to open it up in just a minute, so get your questions ready. I'm going to ask one last one, which is um, when, when I was on the Hill and we had lots of debates, one thing that actually was always a pretty clear area of bipartisan consensus was that the federal government had staked out for itself a significant role around the issue of civil rights and around the issue of social mobi mobility and creating pathways to success um, across uh, across you know different populations, and I think that's lived out in higher education, particularly in the existence of Pell Grants and the recognition that we want low-income students to succeed. Um, but given that particular focus of the federal government traditionally, um, when we think about the completion issue and we recognize that students that have been put at a disadvantage are less likely to complete, we saw all the numbers up here today. Um, how do we think about the role of disaggregated context of completion in whatever Congress might do? How do we think of the role of recognizing that additional investment in Pell, and do we expect more from institutions um, given for Pell students, given that we're making that investment? I think that, I mean, uh, you know, clearly that the, was an interest um, uh, from, you know, House Democrats' point of view for a long time, and I think uh, in the bipartisan reauthorizations that we were able to accomplish, uh, there was a strong focus on how Pell could actually elevate um, uh, students who might not necessarily have the same ability to access higher ed. I think the question is a little bit more complex now because diversity in the demographics is so different, as Amy suggested. I mean, the, just the student population looks different. And the student experience that I, you know, talked about in the first part is so different. Um, and it in, is actually, I think, another, like, civil rights plank. How do we ensure that the experience that a student gets is comparable, at least, so that we know that people who are starting out ahead already, you know, what is it that gets them ahead and how do we ensure that we're making up some of that time while they're in college or at least not putting them in a place where uh, they graduate college further behind? It's a complex issue. I mean, it's, it's a little bit easier on the elementary, secondary side just because I think, you know, we as a society you know, look at having a public education or, you know, and, and, and the fact that in, in most cases, right, it's a requirement that you have to you know, go to high school or you, or you, you can kind of be held accountable. Um, I, I remember when we were on the Hill and Amy was a part of these discussions as well where, you know, we had uh, Chairman Boehner and Chairman McKeon and, and uh, you know, Chairman Klein that in many cases we had Republican members come and say, you know, my school district is not getting any Title I aid and I need to get more money. And we had to look those members in the face and say, your district shouldn't get money. Uh, because your district doesn't need money, and that's a really uncomfortable conversation to have. But it was, but I think from the you know from the top on down, there was an understanding that the role of the federal government was to take take uh, you know care of the disadvantaged students and to actually ensure that you you, you alleviate those concentrated uh, instances of poverty. On the higher education level, it's just a little bit. You know, I just don't think you've got that consensus, um, you know, per se. Maybe part of it is that in some cases we're talking about adults and that maybe Congress, you know, hasn't quite made that assumption as far as, yeah, that, you know, we need to, you know, the federal government does have a role to play, in, you know, in this particular issue. Um, I think the Higher Education Act has evolved into somewhat of a middle class law. Um, you know, that's where I think you get a lot of folks talking about college costs. That's where, you, t you know, a, a lot of these areas. Um, I mean, look at the growth in, you know, plus loans and grad plus and, you know, unsubsidized loans. I mean, that is, you know, that is mainly being born, I think, by and the folks taking advantage of IBR and, and obviously a lot of the trade, the um, research. Think tanks have kind of talked about really who's using these particular programs. Um, so you know, maybe that's something that federal policymakers will have to look at, is which is you know what is the role of the federal government and how you know is there is there a necessity to focus probably a little bit more on the low income side or the disadvantaged side. 
I think you just have to be careful. I mean, to James's point, it's a, it's a very complex topic. Um, you have to be careful about what you do because the last thing you want to do is provide a disincentive for institutions to serve those students. And you put too many requirements on them, and the first thing they're going to do is back away. Um, and so I think that's really challenging. I think there is a bipartisan commitment to Pell and ensuring that that program remains available for the future. Um, I do think it's a little bit interesting. So as, as an example, um, we had Congress had put in place the academic competitiveness grants, a mandatory grant program in a reconciliation bill um, that did look at, that tried to look, it was for Pell, my memory is correct, it was for Pell eligible students. You had to earn a certain GPA in order to, to receive it. Um, and it was additional additional funds. I think it was $750 your freshman year and then over $1,000 um, your sophomore year to get it. The schools all hated it because it required them to kind of keep track of how the student was doing academically. And it was probably one of the few mandatory programs, well, I think the only mandatory program I've ever seen die, um, but that, you know, a mandatory student aid program that actually did die, mm -hmm. um, which is not... Often in a bipartisan case. way, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Frist, that's yeah. A, wasn't it Senator Frist's program? Yeah, the smart yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Smart part of it. And we ended up using the money for something else. Yeah, I can't mm -hmm. remember. Mm -hmm. Probably teacher grants. Yes. <laughs> yeah, seems seems somewhat surprising that was too much to expect that the, the institutions keep track of the success of the students. But I think right. That but is. I mean that that just goes to show how popular it was. <laughs> Yes, and I think this goes back to the who benefits, right? right? When you ask who benefits from a system where we don't ask the question of whether or not the students complete, the answer is the institutions, hands down. But I don't think it's, <laughs> but again, I, don't, I also don't think it's all about the student aid pieces. Again, I think a lot of it, too, is some of the student support programs that are in the law, um, making sure that they're doing what is necessary to also ensure that the students um, have the supports they need to, to kind of be successful in in post-secondary education as well. So. Yeah, that's definitely a big piece. So let me open it up and see who else has questions for us. Cody, do you want to find someone in the room? Hi, I'm Tamara Heiler from Third Way. Uh, so I just want to ask briefly, we've heard a lot on this panel about federal incentives to improve college completion, uh, but we also know that another tool that the federal government has is putting in place sticks. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts on um, what federal sticks you think may or may not be appropriate in addressing college completion, especially if we're thinking about, you know, there are institutions with single digit graduation rates as we've heard about today. What what can or should the federal government do to address that? So, um, go ahead. Uh, so we have the skin in the game proposal that is, I, I would argue, a stick. Um, that many institutions have articulated as a stick, um, <laughs> um, where we looked at the return to Title IV um, system, and when a student withdraws, um, we put the institution on the hook for um, those funds at, at kind of a more real time. Ish rate than what look what they look what they're on the hook for now. Um, we also have kind of the the loan repayment rate um, where we cut off a program. Um, we do have a metric in the law where we cut off a program um, at a certain level if if students aren't repaying their loans. Um, again, getting back to even the incentives conversation, the sticks conversation is, is similar. You have to be careful about what you're doing and how you're putting them in because you don't want to provide um, an easy out for institutions by just saying, well, I'm not going to serve those students. So it's complicated. Right. And a focus on disadvantaged students as an expectation would help get at that. Anybody else have a question for, or did, or did anybody else want to add sticks to the conversation? Congress likes sticks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of times with incentives, I, I remember when I was on the Hill and we talked about incentives, folks said, well, shouldn't they do that anyway? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're giving all this money. Shouldn't they do that anyway? Isn't, isn't an incentive kind of, a, kind of, you know, somewhat an oxymoron whenever you talk about that? So that kind of explained to me I kind of took that to heart, which is that, you know, in many cases, the penalties are something that most, that kind of moves the, moves the needle yeah. um, a lot. Not all cases. I'm just saying it's just that that's, that's something that kind of permeates a lot up there. Yeah, that's a really, it's a good insight, right? The Pell Grant and the, and the student loan volume are the incentive. The question is, what's the expectation that goes with that? Right. Hi, thank you. My name is Anna Solinsky. I'm with the Center for Law and Social Policy. Uh, this is a federal panel, obviously, but also there's a lot of state tools that can be used, including outcomes-based funding. Um, so we've talked a little bit about risk sharing. What do you all think about the potential um, um, 
um, intersections between state outcomes-based funding and potential risk sharing and how institutions or states might react. Want to take that? Amy, I'm sure you've thought about this. So, uh, um, I mean, I, we've seen, we've certainly seen models um, at the state level, I think, trying to to put that, put kind of performance-based funding in the way that states do it is a little bit difficult because of the flows of the dollars, or how dollars flow, I guess to put it better, <laughs> um, how dollars flow at the federal level versus at the state level, because the states are, are actually trying to do, um, trying to help institutions, like it's institutional aid, whereas at the federal level it's, it's um, money to students. So it, it's a little bit different. Um, but it's, it's certainly something that we're keeping an eye on. I think um, some of our continued frustrations at the state level is that you know, it, it, the states don't often look at higher ed as anywhere that they should put their money. So you know, state economy goes down, higher ed I feel like is one of the first things that get cut. Higher ed or the state economy goes up, higher ed is not one of the first places that money goes and in fact usually the, the coffers don't get replenished. So, I do feel like institutions do get a little bit squeezed at the state level um, as well, um, and that is certainly a frustration. But the more, and you know, many of our members um, certainly believe, and you've heard them say this, the more that we pile in with student aid, um, that has kind of a result on the on the tuition side and, and the incentive side on the state level to actually kind of step up and do their part. So we, we're trying to be thoughtful about that as well. Hi, my name is Nathan Arnold. I work at Education Council, so that means I work for Bethany, but I promise she didn't put me up to this. <laughs> um, I wanted to focus on one thing, Amy, you said about accreditation and accreditors having a role in quality assurance, and specifically within the context of PROSPER and allowing perhaps other providers of quality assurance be able to uh, give uh, eligibility to different types of programs. I'm just wondering if there should be consequences for the accreditors, for the quality assurance providers who are not uh, doing their job, as you said in your mind, of being good stewards or good assurers of quality. And then on the other side of it, for the carrots, do you think that there should be uh, statutory protections for quality assurers who are taking actions, whether it be uh, limitations on their legal liability or additional funding, perhaps to protect them in the instance where a particular provider has had its eligibility revoked and is then pursuing uh, legal consequences? Um, so I know we've had some of those. Those Sorry. are questions that we've grappled with. We obviously, um, particularly on the legal liability side, haven't moved forward um, with something. I think it's something that, that folks are still having conversations about. That's kind of a newer idea um, that came to us as we were moving through this process. So it's, it's certainly something we're exploring. Um, on the, the kind of quality assurance of the quality assurers, um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that is, you know, in theory, what Nasiki is, is doing and is supposed to be doing. Um, and I think um, with some of the, the conversations that have gone on um, in the recent history, I think they're, everyone's trying to kind of step up across the board on that front. Um, so I do think with allowing some of these new innovative providers to partner with institutions, that is some protection there. Um, and it, and it's, it is the institution that um, is going to have to agree to allow that to happen and the institution's name and reputation and all of those types of things are on the hook. So I think there is some incentive there for, for institutions to be thoughtful about who they're partnering with. And so I, I do think that that's some sort of um, quality assurance mechanism as well. Hi, good afternoon. Keenan Thompson from Access Lex Institute. Thanks again for putting this on. It's been a great conversation. Um, I guess my question is, is we've heard a lot about um, uh, uh, completion is extraordinarily important and that there has been some allusions to there's just lots of money that's going to these institutions and they may not be actually responding in the way that we want them to, some of them. Um, but it seems as if the, the policy solutions offered have been very much so going towards there's lots of borrowing going on and they're going on in this, this middle class area and it's grad plus and it's plus people and all their loans are getting forgiven. 
when in fact we know that the majority of defaulters are those who aren't completing college. So I guess my question is, what are the federal, what are the bipartisan solutions that would allow us to kind of get at that completion, uh, uh, completion area so that you know, those students can start repaying their loans? Because a lot of the solutions that have been offered are going towards people who are actually paying their loans back. And some of the solutions are, well, let's just cut those loans, their eligibility, or get rid of forgiveness for things like that. So I guess my question is, if the, the, if the taxpayer is most on the hook for those who are not completing college, what are some bipartisan solutions that we can control costs for institutions um, while not limiting access to, to other pieces of uh, other higher education? <coughs> Feels like the sixty-four thousand dollar question. <laughs> Curious if you all have additional thoughts on that. I mean, I don't. I mean, from my <coughs> view, which is far away at this point of at point in time, um, that is the challenge. They're the getting together in a bipartisan way to figure out how you move forward on completion. I think there's there is opportunity to do that, but um, it's going to take a while, which which is to be expected in some sense of the word. I mean. Some things in the higher ed landscape, I think, folks have figured it out. But I do think because completion is somewhat new in that it is, um, as you've heard from all of us, just uh, um, diverse ways of getting at it that we haven't quite figured out where the incentive should be or if there should be a stick or if it's the accreditor or how we make everybody agree that everybody is responsible. Um, it's a, it's a, a deep conversation. It's a complex conversation. I think that's why we probably don't see a lot of bipartisan efforts out there right now. I mean, they're closer to I mean, it, so. It's high stakes, too. Yeah. I mean, you put in the wrong incentive or you put in the wrong stick, and you're going to directly harm the population you're trying to hurt. And so, and then oh. to try and fix it is going to be difficult, whether it be because of CBO scoring or just the mood of Congress or whatever it is. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's going to take yeah. a while. It's high stakes, and also, I mean, Amy alluded to this. Um, you don't get a chance to fix it the next day or even six months down the road. Once it's in there, it's probably in there for a while. Goodness knows if we could have fixed some of the things we saw popping up around NCLB quicker than, sooner than the 15, 16 years it took, we probably <laughs> would have. Um, you know, and there were many attempts, but uh, they just never came to fruition. But um, I think on a lot of these newer issues, even around accreditation, um, it is such a big uh, and can dramatically shift things that are going on in the ground, you know, on the ground, whether it's, you know, uh, where kids are going to school, which ultimately means who's getting the most money. Um, you want to be very, very careful. So I, you know, I applaud folks for taking the time to like really figure it out and also encourage them to try to really figure it out. And I think the first part is having the conversation. I mean, Bethany asked us about this before. Have we had the conversation in previous attempts at reauthorization or conversations around, um, you know, improvements in higher education? And I, I don't think we have. Like, we talked about that. We did in, in smaller ways, but not in this big kind of robust kind of way. So, I mean, the good news is the first step is having the conversation. You have a bipartisan panel up here who was all saying, in some respect, that completion is important. That's the second part. And now we've got to find the policy path forward. That's the hardest part. So. Yeah, these are weighty issues. I mean, you know, I think one thing to kind of keep in mind that when No Child Left Behind passed in 2001, and most of us on this panel actually worked on that bill. We may not say that um, anymore, <laughs> but we did. Um, but, you know, the, the goal of No Child Left Behind wasn't to graduate all kids. It was actually to read. I mean, to make sure that you were able to read by the time that you were in third grade. And we had all these programs that were, and assessments that were kind of geared to that. So I think, you know, the completion issue is on higher ed, it's a huge, weighty issue um, that I think that is going to take some time to kind of, you know, work itself out. Understanding that this may be a multi year kind of effort. You know, you may, this reauthorization process may, you know, just start, you know, making kind of baby steps, you know, to this. Understanding that this is a philosophical, change in the role of the federal government and the understanding about what the purpose of the federal government's role is. I kind of wrote down a few items, um, you know, because Bethany, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but kind of talked about, hey, what are some solutions that we can do? And I kind of wrote down some stupid ideas, I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming, but, you know, it was like, 
you know, maybe you put a few findings in HEA about the importance of college completion, you know, kind of, kind of dealing with that mentality. You know, kind of what Amy's point was is to talk about the importance of completion and graduation rates and, you know, do reports and release those from a national level. I know that there's a lot of reporting that's going on right now, but really have that um, be done in a, in, in a systematic way. Transfer policies, Amy talked about that as well. Benchmarks around academic progress, I don't know. Um, you know, what are some changes that need to be made around TRIO and gear up? Um, you know, personalized learning and how do you look at those support services? I, I think that these are all issues that may not be a 2018 or 2019 issue, but, you know, these as well as other ideas are, are, are things that I, I think there are people who are willing to have an honest conversation. Um, the question is, is, you know, where's the money? Where's the will? And what's doable, I think, in today's political environment. Yeah, I think that seems like a right way to sort of sum things up. I mean, I think we've heard a couple of things about the issue of the spectrum of ways this could be addressed, you know, from just elevating the issue and making sure people are aware, the bully pulpit type of thing, the findings type of thing, through to incentives and, and carrots and sticks, um, policies from multiple directions. It's unlikely to be one. Right. Right. It's a complex mm -hmm. undertaking. It's likely to be triangulating a set of things that are going to get at completion. But I agree, the fact that the issue is squarely on the table, the fact that there's bipartisan support for doing something about it and the figuring out what it is in a bipartisan way um, does seem a, an important next step. Uh, I think often when we work in this legislation, we have all learned the hard way that we have to think first, do no harm. Mm -hmm. And I think we all keep that very top of mind, but I think in this conversation it's important to remember there's a lot of harm going on every day right now in the system. There are a lot of students worse off for us not focusing on completion. And so as we walk away from today, I hope we take with us this idea that there is an opportunity for action in front of us. This bill is on the table and live and I'm excited to have this type of leadership uh, working on it. So thank you all for making time. Let me just bring us um, to a close by saying Thank you to um, AEI for, for hosting us today, uh, to Third Way and AEI for collaborating on this series of papers, um, which I think will really uh, uh, instigate a lot of important conversation. Uh, please join us for uh, some wine in the, in the hallway out here after this. Um, sorry for those of you watching in the live feed, you can have your own wine at home. Um, <laughs> but the rest of us, please join us um, um, for some wine afterwards to talk to the authors of these papers, to talk to our panelists, and please join me in thanking our panelists and our authors for the day. <laughs>